hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, thank you for joining the session today. My name's uh, Bridget McNamara. Uh, so before we start the workshop, I would like to uh, just go over a few housekeeping points. Uh, uh, just so that we can um, understand how the functions will work today um, and then we'll um, commence the workshop officially. Uh, so firstly, um, welcome and, and please uh, note first, we're keen to uh, answer any questions and discuss questions that you have on any of the topics, uh, but we ask that you um, wait to raise your hands at the end of the presentations, please, and we'll allow some time for this. Uh, if also during the presentation, so that we don't have background noise and so that everyone can hear, um, I ask that you mute yourself uh, during the actual presentations, please. To find the raise hand button, um, if you go to the participants list at the bottom of your screen um, and click on that, you'll see that um, then down the bottom of the column, there should be a, a button for you to raise your hands. And um, you can do this um, and we will, um, at the end of the session, then try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, and of course, uh, please remember to unmute yourself uh, at this time. Also, uh, please feel free to use the chat function at any stage throughout the workshop. Uh, so that's found in the bottom of the, uh, the toolbar. So you'll see and um, click on that and then you can type in your comments or questions. Um, and these can be done um, at any stage throughout the workshop or the presentations, and we'll come to those um, as um, at the end for, for discussion time. Um, also, I'd like to advise everyone today that the workshop is being recorded. So um, the University of Melbourne may use the recording for the purposes of training um, researchers at the university, um, including trainees of the Centre of Research Excellence um, in Aboriginal uh, Child and Adolescent Health. Um, but please, if you do not wish to be included in the recording, uh, please reply to my earlier email um, um, or contact me and we can um, edit the recording to remove uh, individuals uh, if you're participating in the discussion but you don't, uh, don't wish to be in the recording. Our first session will go for one and a half hours and we aim to start all three sessions on time. Uh, between the sessions, we'll have short breaks of uh, 10 minutes. So you'll have a moment um, to stretch and also to review the uh, visual representations produced by a graphic artist that we have joining us today. Um, and following the workshop, we'll, we'll send you all a copy of the graphic recordings as summaries of the sessions. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce the chair of our workshop, uh, Professor Sandra Eads. Thank you, Bridget. Um, good morning or good afternoon to you from wherever, wherever you are in the world uh, participating in this workshop. It's a real pity that we've got COVID 2020 and we can't all be together, but I'm pleased that the workshop is continuing and the conference is continuing as planned. My name is Sandra Eads and I welcome you to the workshop on methods and approaches for optimising the use of linked data in Indigenous health research. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we are working today and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, today, I sit on the um, ancestral lands of the Noongar Wajuk people um, in Perth, Western Australia, but wherever you are and whoever the traditional owners are of those lands, we do pay our respects. I extend this respect to the Indigenous cultures across the globe and from where you may be calling today. It is terrific that we have workshop attendees from across Australia, but also from Canada, New Zealand, South Africa and the United Kingdom. Today is a good time to contemplate the collection and use of Indigenous data and the importance of Indigenous data gov governance and sovereignty. And I would like to thank the International Population Data Linkage Network for their inclusion of this workshop in the Virtual International Conference Program. Across the globe, we are seeing social change as we challenge old systems and standards of behaviour. One example is of this is the alarm 
we experience at the use of our Indigenous social media data for the interests of others? Do we want our personal data to be mined and analysed and published? Today, we will also question our standards of practice as researchers, as academics, and examine the issues involved in research data by and about Indigenous peoples. It's not just a question of research ethics in Australia. In Australia, the dispossession of cultural knowledge of Indigenous Australians has had a lasting le legacy. Overlooking our responsibility for meaningful research with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities comes at the cost of positive relationships, trust in researchers and research institutions and the achievement of accurate and high quality research that has the potential to underpin effective health policies and practices. I would like to use this forum to pose to you the idea of starting an international special interest group on data linkage in Indigenous health research, incorporating researchers from across the globe. If you see value in this and there is sufficient level of interest, we would then seek advice um, from the International Population Data Linkage Network on this. To get to know you, who you are, and why you have joined us today, I'd ask that you complete a quick poll that we will, Bridget will bring up on the screen now. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So uh, I'd like you to nominate and tell us whether you're, which of these categories you fit into. And we have great uh, commentary and welcome in the chat function. Um, I can see we've got someone from Tanya from Saskatoon, Canada. Welcome. Um, Paula, Paula Brown from the Kwandamuka people, eastern area of Brisbane. So great to see people from various regions of the world. I'll give it has, um, another minute or so for everyone to to enter, and then um, we can bring up the results of the, of the poll. So it's looking like um, the majority of our participants are researchers or students new to Indigenous health linked data research, which is terrific. And the second largest group are researchers and students experienced in Indigenous health linked data research. Don't have any data custodians. Um, Bridget, can everyone can see the poll results. We have one community member, consumer, um, and that's terrific, but we need more consumer community engagement with this area and a large large group of other participants. So we might close the poll. Yeah. So with this range of backgrounds, I encourage you to participate throughout the workshop. As I said, we have participants from across the globe. Let's share ideas and approaches to develop and share best practice and learn about how we can adapt those from our own research following the conference. We will commence the workshop with some information on Indigenous data governance and data sovereignty, which have international relevance for Indigenous communities in every part of the world. The second part of our workshop will discuss some practical methods for Indigenous data linkage research. And finally, the third session, we will pose some challenging scenarios to you, which reflect the complexity of using linked data in Indigenous health research. Um, alongside our presenters, as Bridget mentioned earlier, a graphic artist, Zara Zanal, will join you in making sense of the concepts and the discussions throughout the course of the workshop. At each, at each break, you will have a chance to look at the graphic recording, and this might help you to review the information and to develop your understanding of the emerging themes that we're sharing. 
Thank you. Um, I really hope you'll be stimulated and take away things that help in your day to day work from our discussions. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Professor Marcia Langton, who will, with uh, other session presenters, talk to you about Indigenous data governance in Australia. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sandy. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, wherever you are in the world. I acknowledge the Wurundjeri and Bunurong peoples and their elders past and present. So we in the Indigenous Data Unit at the University of Melbourne uh, held a conference back in 2017 on Indigenous data sovereignty. And we invited uh, six communities uh, to attend uh, because they uh, had indicated to us in the course of our research that they were um, very concerned about access to data and uh, uh, using data for their um, for developing their priorities in their regions. So uh, as a result of that um, very successful conference, the Indigenous Data Sovereignty Symposium at the University of Melbourne in October 2017, we uh, went on to uh, develop the initiatives that were raised uh, by all of those who attended this symposium. So we now have a wonderful team and we've been uh, conceptualising the issues uh, and, and developing a consistent terminology. Um, so whereas we use data sovereignty uh, to convene the symposium to refer to both uh, the aspiration of Indigenous individuals and communities to autonomous ownership and control of data assets in which they hold an interest and to the legally enforceable mandate of governments to exert authority over the governance of data within a given jurisdictional domain. Um, we uh, propose uh, subsequently to focus on data governance as a practical measure to meet the aspirations of all of those people who contacted us and with whom many, um, many of whom we've subsequently developed uh, partnerships. So data governance refers to the roles, functions and relations involved in exerting this authority, which consequently encom encompass the concept of sovereignty. And uh, hopefully we'll have a uh, journal article published um, on our initiatives soon. Um, the first named author is James Rose, who will speak soon. So uh, our approach from the very beginning was built on the principle of subsidiarity. Uh, based on several uh, rights and organising frameworks uh, that will be discussed by others. Uh, but in terms of human rights practice, the key is subsidiarity. An organising pr principle that matters ought to be handled by the smallest, lowest, or at least centralised competent authority. In other words, go local. So as a result of our emphasis on the local, we were approached by the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation and the Coalition of Peaks uh, to deliver on uh, their Closing the Gap Priority 4 um, because we'd asked the question, how can appropriate Indigenous data governance contribute to improved health service delivery? Um, and uh, in Australia, uh, the community controlled health sector and communi Indigenous communications sectors have been extraordinarily successful in limiting the impact of, the, of COVID-19 to far less than 100 cases in a total population of 800,000. So they've demonstrated beyond doubt globally the effectiveness of the Aboriginal health in Aboriginal hands approach. And of course, we've become familiar throughout the pandemic with uh, uh, the practices of epidemiology, daily data collection and reporting, the ubiquity of epidemiological data analysis for pandemic responses and the goal of low R numbers. Um, and all reflect the now critical use of data in population health responses. Um, so the community groups that uh, have come to us since 2017 
have uh, common goals. They want to ensure that uh, data governance and decision-making structures are in their own hands. Uh, they want self-determination and they want to be able to deliver services to their communities based on their own needs, cultures and relationship to land. They're confronting institutional racism in government mainstream institutions and agencies. And they want to ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people can access the services they need in a culturally safe way. And that, of course, includes data sharing. So sharing data and information with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to ensure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have more power to determine their own development. And these became the, uh, uh, the substance of the priority four of the new partnership developed between NACHO and Australian governments on closing the gap. Um, here's some data on life expectancy for Indigenous Australians. Um, now, while uh, there's been some improvement in the, in the decade uh, before, the decades before this data became available, um, we still have uh, very serious mortality problems uh, to attend to, um, arising from circulatory disease, um, such as heart disease, stroke and hypertension, um, as well as uh, increasing cancer mortality rates. Um, so 64% of the total burden of disease among Indigenous Australians is due to chronic diseases. Um, and 39% of the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians health outcomes can be explained by social determinants. And I raise these issues because it goes to the question of the empowerment of Indigenous people. What if Indigenous people were empowered to improve their health? Um, this has become uh, a, the organising principle for the for the uh, those who are responsible for delivering on the closing the gap partnership, which is a way of substantiating human rights through the principle of subsidiarity. Nacho represents uh, more than 150 local Aboriginal services and the Coalition of Peaks represents over 50 uh, bodies representing local Aboriginal people. Um, the Closing the Gap strategy of the Australian government uh, has failed because it is a top-down approach and the data collection, measurement and reporting um, instruments are entirely in the hands of governments and Indigenous people have no say in the priorities or indicators of, pro of progress or failure. The data is managed by governments and this disempowers the Indigenous health service providers from setting their own priorities and targets. While it purports to address social determinants of health, it falls far short. Um, and we are hopeful that our approach will uh, deliver on um, da Indigenous data governance through the partnership agreement um, and self-determination. So I refer you to that partnership agreement. It's certainly a major breakthrough in the way that Indigenous Australians uh, engage with Australian governments. Um, <clears throat> The priority reforms uh, respond to the aspirations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and were uh, overwhelmingly supported, um, particularly uh, in relation to sharing data and information. Um, this has become the focus of our work um, and we will establish six trials in partnership with Aboriginal communities to establish Indigenous data governance. This will involve building an Indigenous data platform with local Indigenous data governance, effective ownership and control of Indigenous data assets, opportunities for data linkage with key data custodians in the health sector. And I should say in relation to that, that we have developed um, some very um, fruitful partnerships with major government data custodians, such as the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare and the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Um, so uh, this becomes important when we look at the main health target of the closing the gap, and that is halving the gap in mortality rates for Indigenous children under five. Um, all of these initiatives began um, in the human rights arena uh, with the 
Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner report of 2005, in which he recommended that the governments of Australia commit to achieving a quality of health status and life expectation between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and non-Indigenous peoples with, within 25 years. And as I said, uh, we're, the, the strategy, the closing the gap strategy uh, is very far from reaching any of its, well, its main targets. And as I've mentioned, the social determinants of health has been uh, an important um, underpinning of these goals. Poverty, literacy, accessibility to healthcare, overcrowded houses, poor infant diet, all of these are typical, uh, typically are the um, most common indicators when uh, the social and cultural determinants of health are examined. And so too, we find that uh, people's health improves when they have more control uh, over their lives. Um, and uh, this has been reported on in Australia for um, almost two decades now and drives, I think, the um, emphasis on uh, joining up the local with the central. So if you look at it, this map of Australia, you can see that we have hundreds of uh, Indigenous language speaking groups. Uh, many of these languages are extinct or endangered, but the people survive. And uh, so across this vast continent, there are many Indigenous nations who are keen to link their Indigenous data assets with uh, the, the data assets of uh, major government custodians in order to be able to improve their situation. So one of our goals is overcoming the lack of granularity in closing the gap data, which is usually uh, national, um, highly crunched, and fairly useless. So uh, we wanna work with uh, local groups. And as I say, in, initially in six trial sites to determine local priorities by linking local indigenous data assets to larger data assets owned or stewarded by national or state or territory data custodians, such as the Australian Bureau of Statistics and the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. Develop a sense of ownership um, amongst those local entities um, of the priorities, of their priorities, uh, by uh, involving them as key participants in the governance and use of their data. So we are developing local um, data governance um, instruments and linking priorities to local programs to achieve the highest level of feasibility in closing the gap. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. I think we're moving on to James Rose, who's presenting the second part of this work workshop session. Yes, thank you, Sandra. I'll just share my screen. Okay. So following on from uh, Marcia's uh, presentation, I'd like to step back and just provide a bit more of a general context uh, for the work that we do at the Indigenous Data Network. Um, and one specific um, element in the program of work um, that we are conducting towards the establishment of a national framework for Indigenous data governance in Australia, which is the promotion of a set of terms and definitions around Indigenous data governance that focuses on data as an asset. And I'm just going to jump straight in, um, keeping in mind that um, we're saving questions for the end. But uh, look, before I, um, before I go on, I, I also would like to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people who are the rightful custodians of Naram, which is the proper name uh, for Melbourne where I am at the moment. So as Marcia mentioned, the IDN uh, is an initiative of the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health within the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Melbourne. Um, it is housed within the Indigenous Data Network um, Sandy is our chair, Sandra Eads, and Marcia is co-chair and founder, and our steering committee is comprised of a number of luminary uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous researchers in relevant um, disciplines um, and uh, our staff. In order to contextualise um, this discussion, 
it's often necessary for both international and domestic audiences to be acquainted with the history of data governance in Australia from a, a governmental perspective. So as a, as a colony, Australia has been through a radical transition um, from uh, its uh, pre-colonial uh, governmental um, uh, uh, days and its colonial and now late colonial um, orientation. Prior to 1788, governance in Australia, which included data governance, was characterised by a distributed and decentralised uh, system of egalitarian equilibrium. So regional um, governance committees effectively formed a very, very stable and persistent um, vehicle for managing a, a vast land mass um, replete with resources and a thriving population, um, a religious landscape and so forth. With the invasion and occupation uh, of the continent by Britain in 1788, there was a, a radical transition towards centralised government um, and a reorientation towards the governance, not only of the land and the population, but also of its resources um, in service of uh, basically extractive industry. And so data governance was treated in the same way. Um, indigenous data from 1788 onwards was treated by the centralised government of Australia as a resource to be extracted. And it went through three approximate phases, um, you know, for the purposes of summary here. The, the first phase was geared towards the extraction of information from Indigenous individuals and communities about the distribution um, of resources, uh, such as water in the first instance, uh, food, timber, um, pathways through impenetrable terrain that would facilitate expansion um, of the British colonial authority. And at the same time, it was oriented towards neutralising the risk posed by Indigenous people to a very small British colonial population. Because for the first 70 odd years um, of Australia's colonial history, Indigenous people remained in a majority and, and did pose um, an existential threat risk uh, to, to the British population. So a lot of the data that was being collected at that time really was geared towards knowing how many Indigenous people um, there were in particular localities, what their, uh, and, and threat assessment, so their capacity to um, constrain British expansion. When the population balance tipped after the 1850s, British um, attitudes towards data governance pivoted towards managing the allocation of Indigenous labour around um, regionalised economies, primarily in the service of pastoralism. Um, and at the same time, continue to focus on eradicating the Indigenous population up until uh, World War II via a process of eugenicist uh, programs. After World War II, most of the elements of those programs became unsustainable and unfavourable because of the pivot of Europe uh, towards um, a more sort of congenial uh, model of economic development rather than an expansive colonial one. However, there were some threads in that eugenicist um, eradication program um, that continued up until the 1970s um, uh, because of uh, Australian government attitudes towards Indigenous people generally. And of course, I'm talking about child removal in particular. From the 1970s onwards, um, against a backdrop of armed uh, um, decolonization movements in the rest of the world, um, together with the emergence of international um, agreements around fundamental human rights, uh, the Australian government pivoted its data governance um, strategy towards the delivery of essential services uh, into Indigenous communities, which include, of course, health, education, employment, um, and a number of other services. Now, this has left us with a situation, a contemporary situation in Australia, where we have uh, a very, very high volume of Indigenous data assets distributed around the country in a, in a in a state that could be characterized as incoherent. So there is no formal or consistent recognition of indigenous data as a discrete subset of data um, with uh, discrete attributes. There is no integration of indigenous data governance principles or instruments across jurisdictions from a local state territory to a federal level. There is no coherent national government framework at a Commonwealth level alone. 
and existing Australian legislation that is purported uh, to be relevant to data governance uh, is heavily focused on privacy concerns um, rather than the recognition of data as a form of property um, and also largely predates the advent um, of the internet. So it was almost completely irrelevant um, to a, a modern um, evaluation and integration of uh, uh, best practice data governance principles. We do have at the moment <clears throat> a draft bill um, which has been released for submission in the data availability and transparency bill. However, that gives no regard to the origins of much of the data um, for which the Australian government acts as custodian and steward um, as having been acquired illegally under past regimes. Um, now, where the IBN starts in promoting um, the definition of data as an asset is in the internationally accepted uh, construal of data as the product of intellectual, cognitive and intellectual work. So many of you in the audience will have heard of the data information knowledge wisdom hierarchy, which is a, a sort of a semantic um, way of describing the successive um, refinement of uh, uh, what we call semantic products or uh, in the first instance, um, human experience through to specialized forms of knowledge and language and finally into quantifiable points of data. Um, but we elaborate on this by saying that the, um, the in cognitive intellectual work that is invested in this process of refining um, uh, information or semantic product uh, has discrete features depending on the population engaged in that work. And so Indigenous peoples of Australia have uh, a unique and distinct history spanning uh, at least 60,000 years um, of investing cognitive intellectual work in generating specialised knowledge, uh, specialised um, uh, forms of language, and as a consequence, um, specialised forms of data. Now, there are other international instruments that treat um, data uh, in this kind of a way. Most recently, we have the General Data Protection Regulation in the EU, which was brought, uh, brought into effect in 2018, which um, distinguishes between data subjects as individual people who uh, invest this intellectual work in the generation of data. It distinguishes them from data controllers and processors. Um, and there are convergent international principles and guidelines which act as corollary or sort of auxiliary um, supports for the GDPR in terms of um, the language that it uses. And this includes the principles listed below in various form. Now, the recognition of data as an asset um, and more particularly Indigenous data as the, an asset in which Indigenous people have a specific interest is corroborated um, by a number of instruments. The World Economic Forum's 2011 definition, um, which supports the DIKW um, production sequence model, was delivered in response to the emergence and consolidation of Web 2.0 which is that virtual forum in which most of the world's global trade is now conducted um, and which has seen the rise of the so-called tech giants who trade exclusively in data and in a regulatory vacuum over the past 10 to 20 years have uh, managed to carve out dominant market positions for themselves which make them almost completely um, uh, um, unmanageable for national level governments um, uh, corollary with the World Economic Forum's definition, we have the International Accounting Standards Board and the International Financial Reporting Standards uh, Foundation, which refers to data as a resource controlled by an entity as the result of past events and from which economic benefits are expected to flow to that entity in the future, which helps us understand the tacit um, program of data governance undertaken by Australian governments both historically and in the present, because their attitude towards data that has been generated by and about Indigenous people is tacitly organised around extracting a profit or some sort of other future value for uh, the Australian economy and the major um, investors 
or at least um, stakeholders in that economy. Um, and now up until the 1970s and still to the present, uh, these interests are at odds with indigenous interests for the reasons that I outlined previously. Now, where linked population data fits into this model um, is around leveraging um, a set of terms and definitions and a, and a framework um, for understanding and implementing those terms and definitions based on international best practice um, with the instruments, policies and guidelines I've outlined towards conferring uh, 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 rightful control and oversight of Indigenous data um, upon Indigenous people and governance bodies. So when we're talking about linking uh, existing data sets together, uh, we are then um, enabled or we are using these, uh, these terms and definitions, allow ourselves the opportunity to ask what function does data linkage serve under these circumstances? So if we are talking about data as an asset with real financial value and an asset in which indigenous people have a real and measurable interest, we can ask ourselves what function does data linkage serve in modeling the extent and integrity of the assets in question where they are often distributed and um, in, a, in a disintegrated state because of historical practices. We can ask ourselves what function data linkage serves in modeling the processes by which the asset was generated, were they those processes targeted um, um, at the eradication or discrimination um, of Indigenous people in a national context? And what function does data linkage serve in identifying the owners, custodians, and stewards of that asset? And none of these roles and relations um, have yet been addressed um, in Australia. So those are some issues that might raise some questions and uh, sorry for taking so much time. Hopefully um, there'll be scope to discuss momentarily. Um, sorry, uh, Sandra, I think I'm throwing back to you. Thanks, James. And over to Darren Clinch, who's talking about complexities of delivering benefits to Aboriginal people from linked data. Thank you, Darren. Well, good morning. Um, and thank you, Sandra. Um, as Sandra uh, said, my name is Darren Clinch. I'm Buddy Meyer from Yamaji country right over in WA. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people whose land I've been uh, living and working on for the past 12 years. So um, I'm the data analytics coordinator for the Indigenous Data Network. And because of COVID-19, I still haven't been into my new office. Um, and prior to that, I worked for the Department of Health and Human Services, um, this, which is part of the Victorian state government here, who have obviously been very central to uh, the Victorian response to COVID-19. Um, so the things that I'm gonna talk about a little bit um, are kind of looking at what was happening on the other side of the fence. So in the nine and a half years I worked at um, Department of Health and Human Services, I worked in Aboriginal Health and Wellbeing Branch. Um, I particularly started off as health, working in just the health side because that was my field. Um, but then I started to be asked to do more work on things like child protection data, uh, out of home care, housing and homelessness, disability. And then I became known as the Aboriginal data guy. Um, so any more time people wanted data, they wanted to, um, uh, get me to help them with it. So um, in that time, I had the opportunity to work on a project called the Victorian Social Investment and Integrated Data Resource, which is an enduring linkage map um, based upon a spine, which uh, captures about 99.9% .9 of the Victorian population, which is around 6 million. So the spine, they use um, the uh, Electoral Commission, births, deaths, marriages, and um, uh, uh, big roads, so licenses and registration, that kind of thing. And so what they've done is they've um, progressively added more and more data to that um, enduring linkage map. And now that's turned into the full project called Visitor. So while I was there um, and when I worked there, it was, I worked in system intelligence and analytics. So I provided business intelligence development and geospatial support. So as you'll notice, I'm far more of a techie guy and technical staff rather than an academic. So uh, I'm really privileged to be working with people like Marcia 
and James and Kristen and Kalinda, and I'll hopefully learn a bit more of the academic world from them. So my main task was building dynamic data dashboards and mapping data. And so as Marcia pointed out, the, the, um, the Tyndale or Horton map, whichever one you'd like to call it, um, I have been doing a lot of work in that space to say, okay, how do we get a way of presenting data that is uh, relevant to Aboriginal people rather than administrative boundaries? And here's an example of this. So you can see this is Yorta Yorta country versus the Greater Shepparton administrative boundary. And so looking at the data and, and the experience that I had working um, on that visitor um, data set was I was able to look at Aboriginal people in, in an administrative approach across a whole heap of um, areas. So whether it was um, hospital admissions, uh, ED presentations, whether it was having contact with uh, the child protection system, whether it was um, things like chemo, uh, radiotherapy minimum data sets. And what we did was we worked through all of this data and one of the big issues was how, how do you define and decide whether a person is Aboriginal in that data set? So at first, what they did was they used the ever Aboriginal. Um, so if you're identified once, you, then you're always Aboriginal, no matter how many touch points you had. So then they developed another one called most. So you had to be identified at least 50% of the time. And then what we did was we, because in Victoria, we have a program called ICAP, which is the Improving Care for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Patients Program. Um, that was, uh, we, any time an Aboriginal person would present to a hospital in Victoria, um, if they were identified, uh, they would receive a 30% loading on the WIS, which is the, the funding that would go to the hospital. So in Victoria, the hospital system is, um, is a devolved governance model. So the hospitals and health services aren't part of the Department of Health and Human Services, which is um, not the case in other places and jurisdictions. So what that did, it had a direct impact upon hospitals really making an effort to prompt Aboriginal people to self-identify. Now, from personal experience, I know that um, if someone tried to identify me by my appearance, I could quite easily be mistaken for Greek or Italian or even Latin American. So that, that highlights another issue with the way that the system was recording Aboriginal people having touch points across all the um, D, uh, DHHS funded services. So I worked fairly closely with some analysts. Um, we ran some uh, different types of algorithms and we came up with the most preferred. Now, back in 2011, I think it was, um, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare um, did a, an audit of hospitals in Victoria to look at how effective the self-identification process was. And they said that, and the report says that it was around 80%. Although we, when we did some further um, analysis, we found there were certain health services in Victoria, which I obviously won't name, where that identification was very low. It was nowhere near 80%. So one of the things that we were hoping that um, the linkage data within the department would do would help us with things like familial linkage so if you're thinking about young children who obviously uh, aren't prompted to self-identify, quite often their, their Indigenous status is recorded by the existing Indigenous status of their parent. So if there happen to be a non-Aboriginal woman with an Aboriginal partner and that child is identified, they, the migration of non-Indigenous status would go to the child from the mother. So there was a fair few programs and projects that have been done to try and look at this. And now that we have the benefit of this massive uh, linked data resource, um, how do we then get the benefit of that linked resource outside the government? And so now I'm, um, you know, nine, uh, seven months ago, just before the pandemic started, I moved over to the Indigenous Data Network. And I'm uh, one of my key aims is to try and get access to that visitor data set for the benefit of Aboriginal organisations. But then I'd need to be able to give them the caveat to say, okay, this is what how the Indigenous status uh, was used in the data set. So, you know, you really need to be uh, mindful of that if you're going to use this uh, massive data uh, resource. So what I'll show you next is um, I, I do a lot of mapping and the linkage data is going to be perfect for this. But what I tend to do is in, in the absence of having linked data, I quite often use a, a thing called associative data modelling. So what you can see on this map here is this is the Aboriginal population. I'm also displaying point data that relates to location of hospitals 
and also locations of Aboriginal community control uh, organisations and Aboriginal community control health organisations. And so this is the kind of um, visualisation of that data that we need to be able to make sure that Aboriginal community controlled organisations can get access to. So this is uh, the Geelong region of Victoria. So Geelong's a, a major um, city that's about, um, uh, I think it's about an hour drive um, west of, southwest of uh, Melbourne. So this is uh, Wadawong country. And as you can see, the little red um, teardrop, that's the location of the Wadawong Aboriginal Community Controlled Organisation. And what I've done is I've used some spatial analysis here to uh, create drive time catchments. So that you've got zero to five, five to 10, 10 to 15. And so the benefit of getting linked data into the hands of Aboriginal organisations will be this. Wadawong is, um, works fairly closely with uh, the Koori Maternity Services and also maternal child health. And if they can see what's going on when Aboriginal people are not um, accessing their services, then they can kind of work out, well, what do we need to do to create integrated approaches to creating wraparound services for these? And when we can see an increase in the completion of maternal child health visits, an increase in visualization, uh, sorry, um, immunizations, increase in uh, early childhood work, we can kind of see those results in when we see the NAPLAN results in the first couple of years of primary school. And now all of those data sets are being lined up and we can see Aboriginal people, not just in silo, which is what the government has tended to do in the past, but we can see their life course and all the touch points they're having along the way. So linked data is incredibly important for Aboriginal community controlled organisations to get that full holistic view of what's going on with their clients. And so, I might leave it there, otherwise I'll talk for an hour and I'll pass back to you, Sandra. Thank you very much. Thanks, Darren. Um, another very interesting segment to this session. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Kristen Smith and she's speaking on the importance of research ethics for Indigenous data governance. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks, Sandra. I'll just share my screen to begin with in a second. Is that my PowerPoint coming up or no? Uh, yes, 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 we can see. Yep. Okay, sure. Um, so it's just the full slide screen you can see. Yes. Yep. Okay, thank you. Sorry, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri and the Boon peoples who are the traditional owners of the land, lands on which I work and I live. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and other Indigenous people who are attending this workshop today. So as Sandra mentioned, my name is Kristen Smith and I'm a medical anthropologist and senior research fellow in the Indigenous Studies Unit at the University of Melbourne. I'm also the research coordinator of the Indigenous Data Network. So I've been working on issues related to Indigenous health since about 2011. And most of my research is quite interdisciplinary, crossing the fields of medical anthropology, epidemiology, human geography, public health and other issues. Um, over the past decade, Professor Langton and I have undertaken research with a large number of varied Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, mainly across the top end of Australia in the Northern Territory, Queensland and Northern Western Australia. But also more recently, we've been working in a few cross-border regions of Victoria and New South Wales. So much of this work has used mixed methods approaches centred on issues related to alcohol management in Indigenous communities, but also more recently investigating family violence and several other health related areas, um, including research examining digital technologies for Indigenous health. So Marcia spoke earlier about um, the symposium that we held at the University of Melbourne in 2017, um, so the Data Sovereignty Symposium. So I was one of the um, co-conveners of this. And as she mentioned, one of the outcomes of this symposium was the establishment of the Indigenous Data Network, um, aiming to drive the agenda of progressing Indigenous data sovereignty and governance in Australia for Indigenous communities. 
Um, so today I'm going to be briefly talking about how Indigenous research ethics serve as a really key tool to embed Indigenous data governance principles throughout the research process. So obviously research ethics aren't everything, they're not the be all and end all, but they really are a very important mechanism to assist you to, in that practice. So ethical conduct in human research is really more than ethical do's and don'ts. It refers to an ethos that should permeate the way those engaged in human research approaches in all that they do in their research. So a cornerstone of an ethical research relationship with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is respect for and valuing of cultural and language diversity, which is where that principle of subsidiarity that Marcia spoke about comes up into play. So addressing and adhering to research ethics principles, guidelines and codes are incredibly important in the context of your research, as they provide the vehicle by which you can ensure that really considered strategies of ethical practice, including Indigenous data governance, are embedded across your projects. So the best ethical research practice occurs in the partnership, design and planning stages of a project. However, ethical practice also permeates every other stage of the research process and should be revisited regularly as research proceeds. So some of the considerations that research ethics require in the context of Indigenous data governance include who is included and who should be excluded as Indigenous for the purposes of data collection. Um, also determining the data that reflects Indigenous interests, values and priorities. So what are the priorities of the people that you are doing research with? And also it should th be thinking through and determining the content of data collected and who has access to these data. So I'm just gonna to briefly touch on the United Nations Declaration of, of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So in 2007, after more than 20 years of negotiated, negotiations at the United Nations levels, Indigenous people globally welcomed the adoption of the declaration, which Australia endorsed in 2009. So the declaration articulates the rights of Indigenous peoples, many of which are directly relevant to how we ethically design, engage and, and conduct in Indigenous research. So the declaration sets out the right of Indigenous people to set their own priorities, to make their own decisions, and to freely pursue their own development in their own terms. And another way we can look at it is, in, is the types of researcher responsibilities that are inferred by the declaration. So they're also set out in a number of codes and principles that I'll be talking about in a little bit of detail, but um, that it's a researcher's responsibility to understand the meaning of self-determination, the rights articulated in the declaration and how these rights can be recognized in research. Um, it also is about recognising and differentiating between individual, group and or collective rights, responsibilities and ownership. And also it's about a researcher's responsibility to only undertake the research if it doesn't conflict with individual rights, freedoms and dignity. So these are things that you really need to talk, think, of, think through at the outset of any research that you, you undertake and make sure that all of your research is embedded with this. So I'm just going to briefly look at the Australian National Research Ethics Framework. So in the context of Australia, the framework is quite extensive, like in codes, standards and a whole other rich practice. So to start with, the Australian 2018 Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research is a principles-based document that articulates the broad principles and responsibilities that underpin the conduct of all Australian research. So it was developed jointly by the NHMRC, so the National Health and Medical Research Council, the Australian Research Council and the Universities of Australia. Um, and it has a broad relevance to all research disciplines. The code sets out the broad principles that characterise an honest, ethical and conscientious um, research culture. It outlines the expectations for the conduct of research in Australia or research conducted under the auspices of Australian institutions. So in particular, principle six of the Australian code refers to the recognition of the right of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to be engaged in research that affects or is of particular significance to them. 
So this includes recognising, valuing and respecting the diversity, heritage, knowledge, cultural property and connection to land of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It covers the necessity to engage Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples prior to research being undertaken. So note that it says engage rather than consult. Um, often consulting Aboriginal people has been an issue in the past because it doesn't really do any of that deep diving work to establish trust. Um, so as I said, principle six speaks directly to Aboriginal research with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, but there is also formally, the code formally recognises the responsibility of researchers to engage with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and respect their legal rights and local laws, customs and protocols. So there are elements within that overarching code that speak specifically to Indigenous research. So then we have, after the overarching code, we have a national statement of ethical conduct in human research. And this provides a national reference point for ethical considerations relevant to all research involving humans. So it provides guidance for researchers, ethics committees, institutions, organisations and the public on how such research should be designed and conducted so it conforms to those principles and reflects the values. The national statement explicitly addresses issues of research governance. It not only provides guidelines for researchers, HREX and others conducting ethical review, but also emphasises the institution's responsibilities for the quality, safety and ethical acceptability of research. Um, and so we also, I'm going to talk a little bit more detail in the next slide about the, the new IATSIS code of ethics that has only recently been published and their guide to applying the code. It's um, updated the 2012 Jurace that was in the past. But there is also in this framework, the guidelines for ethical research um, in Australian Indigenous studies, and it's underpinned by standards of ethical research and human rights. So this guideline sets out the requirements that Indigenous people must be full participants in research projects that concern them, share an understanding of the aims and methods of research, and also share in the results of this work. So as you can see, some of the principles of data sovereignty and data governance are embedded within these, these guidelines and practices. Um, so at every stage, the guidelines say that at every stage, research with and about Indigenous peoples must be founded on a process of meaningful engagement and reciprocity between the researcher and Indigenous people. Um, then we also have keeping research on track, which is actually more for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participants, so communities or the, the people that the research is with or about. Um, and it is designed for these communities when they're considering being involved or conducting health research themselves to support the research participants make decisions about whether they want to be involved in the research. So as I mentioned, IATSIS have um, recently published a new code of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ethics. Um, and this new code really has, speaks to four key principles. So as I've got them listed here, it's about self, Indigenous self-determination, Indigenous leadership, impact and value, and also sustainability and accountability. So IATSA's first published ethics guidelines way back in 1999, and at the time they represented a really new approach in Australia to research ethics that repositioned Indigenous peoples from subjects of research to partners in research. And this new code supersedes, as I said, the Jurace, the Guidelines for Ethical Research in Australian Indigenous Studies. So while conventional ethics frameworks emerge from the obligation to respect individual human dignity and protect the vulnerable, the ethical principles underpinning this code proceed from a presumption of Indigenous authority as self-determining peoples and as rights holders, whose knowledge and contribution to research must be recognised, respected and valued. Um, so I guess this is just a diagram looking at those four principles in more detail. So you can see here Indigenous self-determination also um, is, is it's looking at Indigenous peoples as those who have rights among others to strengthen their institutions, practice, teach and protect cultural traditions and knowledge systems and to develop and use their own lands and waters. And it sets out that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research projects that involve one or more communities or organisations should be underpinned by a negotiated agreement or protocol. 
So such agreements and protocols can articulate roles and responsibilities of researchers and partners and any understandings reached about the research that is to be undertaken. So this is a relatively new thing. They're, suggest they're saying that everyone doing research with communities really should have a written agreement with communities themselves. So the second principle is um, looking at Indigenous leadership. And to demonstrate merit, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research should be led by Indigenous people. So what that means is a whole variety of different things. But Indigenous leadership can be demonstrated, for example, through governance and oversight of a project or a program of work, partnerships or collaboration, or commissioning of research by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations. So principle three, impact and value, um, is probably quite um, self-exploratory for many of you, but research ethics frameworks really are founded on research being of benefit to, and value to society and those participating in the research. So this particular principle sets out that research with Indigenous peoples must aim to benefit Indigenous peoples. Seems quite obvious, but hasn't always been the case. So the benefits can be tangible or intangible and it can include, among other things, employment on the project and research training. It could be access to research results, including the data in a form that is really useful and accessible for those involved in the research. Um, it could be assistance to access cultural or other records, um, or it could be assistance with lang language, culture and music workshops. There's a whole variety of different ways that there could be impact and value in the project. So prior to beginning the research, there really should be a shared understanding by all research partners and participants about the potential impacts but also the potential risks of the research project. So the fourth principle, sustainability and accountability. So these principles require that research is designed and conducted to meet both present and future needs of the people involved in the research. And it also means ensuring that the knowledge and data collected during research projects are available for use and current for future, for, for current and future generations. For example, through the return of materials or data to communities and through appropriate archiving. So I've just picked out a couple of particularly interesting points in the new IATSIS code, specifically looking at Indigenous knowledge and data, but also ongoing Indigenous governance. So this is specifically set out in the new IATSIS code. So as you can see, 2.7 to 2.9 are specifically looking at Indigenous knowledge and data and 4.3 is ongoing Indigenous governance. So as you can see, Indigenous peoples have the right to manage collection, interpret and use their own information. Um, it also talks to the contribution of Indigenous peoples' knowledge, resources and access to data, um, but also the responsibility or well, institutions with the responsibility for data access and use policies or design and management of data ecosystems should adopt Indigenous data sovereignty and governance pr principles. So it's very explicit in this code. And to do with ongoing Indigenous governance, Indigenous people have the right to manage the creation, the collection, analysis, interpretation. So you can see it all here, I'm not gonna read it all, but it's all about the rights of Indigenous people to the data in the context of the research that's being undertaken. I'm just briefly got this up here because it will be relevant to quite a few of you. I think there is actually um, review of this going on, the National Best Practice Guidelines for Data Linkage Activities, but this is the current version. Um, it was initially brought about by a request from the Coalition of Australian Governments um, directed to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare and the Australian Bureau of Statistics to develop best practice guidelines for linking data related to Indigenous people. So quite a few of you will have seen this before, but for those who haven't, there is a, a key principle in here that's relevant. The first principle, looking at the values and ethics in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research. Um, but there are also guidelines related to data linkage activities and research relating to um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that it should be conducted obviously in accordance with the NHMRC and IATSIS guidelines. Um, just a really quick look at some of the Aboriginal research ethics communities and other relevant processes across the nation. So not all um, states and jurisdictions, states and territories have Aboriginal health ethics committees, but some of them do. So as you can see here, there's the Western Australian, Western Australia does. Um, IATSIS actually has a research ethics committee that covers the 
ACT. There are two in New South Wales, one in South Australia. Um, and there is also the top end human research ethics committees. They're not specifically Indigenous um, run or led, but they do deal with um, Indigenous projects. There's actually over 200 human research ethics committees and organisations across Australia that are registered with the NHMRC, which makes them official. Um, so the NHMRC's National Certification Scheme for Ethics Review of Multi-Centre Research actually enables the single ethics and scientific review of human research that is occurring at multiple institutions in Australia. So this means that researchers only need to submit an ethics application to one human research ethics committee, sometimes. <laughs> um, there, there are a lot of caveats around this. But it is always a good idea, regardless of the data linkage research or other research that you might be doing, to always get in touch with the, whether it be the jurisdictional body, so whether it's the Western Australia or, you know, VACHO down here in Victoria, or it might be AMSANT in, Northern in the Northern Territory, if you're unsure if there's specific ethics um, applications you need to be getting through and approvals for your research. So I've also noted here, although they're not formal human research ethics committees, there are also many regional Aboriginal health research subcommittees across Australia that do require you to put in an application for your research before you can actually submit to a HREC. Um, similarly, the, a lot of the Aboriginal community controlled health organisations have similar research committees that you need to apply for. Um, so I'll finish up here, but just to note that the outcomes of data linkage studies can directly or indirectly influence the well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And we really must acknowledge that these policies and programs can develop from that type of work. Um, studies that use linked data really do have to adhere to the appropriate codes and guidelines for research involving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, for a whole range of issues, but particularly in terms of what we're talking about today, to ensure that you embed Indigenous data governance within all research that you do. So, you know, it, it does mean that additional to ethics and data custodian approval, community approval really must be sought as well. And so I know that's quite difficult if you're doing national studies, but there are always um, national bodies, so you could approach NACHO, and I'm sure there are similar in international jurisdictions as well. So by paying close attention to the code statements and guidelines and principles, um, Indigenous data governance can and should be addressed in all research concerning Indigenous peoples. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, great to hear from you um, in that session about ethics. I'll now invite our last speaker, Kalinda Griffiths, to talk about international issues of critical importance in the use of linked data pertaining to Indigenous peoples. Thanks, Kalinda. Thanks, Sandra. Can everyone hear me? Great. So thanks for the opportunity to be here today to talk about some of the international issues regarding the use of linked data pertaining to Indigenous and tribal peoples around the globe. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're all meeting here today. Um, I'm in Darwin and I'd like to acknowledge the Larrakia people, the saltwater people, and pay my respects to all elders, those of the past, the present and the future. I'd also like to acknowledge other um, Indigenous peoples here today. Um, my name is Kalinda Griffiths and I'm a proud Yawu woman. Um, my country is in Broome in Western Australia. Um, I'm also an epidemiologist and I work at the Centre for Big Data Research and Health at the University of New South Wales. Um, so my work primarily uses um, data at the population level linked, um, uh, or population level linked data or big data um, to better understand why some populations are healthier than others. Um, although I am a cancer epidemiologist by trade, sorry, my throat is going a bit crazy. <coughs> I'm a cancer epidemiologist by trade. Um, but my interest is in the usability of existing data and linkage data for the purposes of research and community development. And so if we're talking about linked data in an official capacity, that is data used for the purposes of official reporting, um, there are a number of considerations that require our attention within the Indigenous context. And now this includes thinking about the existing and ever-changing data infrastructures and regulatory landscapes, 
Um, it includes addressing issues of Indigenous recognition and identification within nations, and it also includes discussions about priority setting and governance and the use of data, as well as the methodological and statistical considerations that may be relevant within Indigenous data contexts. Um, we don't have time to go over everything, um, but what I would like to do here today is briefly give a broader conceptual overview of some of the critical issues that require our attention. When we talk about um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander data, uh, people in official statistics and data collections. Um, so last year, um, several of us working across official data collections published a review on Indigenous identification in Australia, recognising that identification is the central issue to data collected about Indigenous peoples globally. It was one of nine articles from five nations discussing the identification of Indigenous peoples in their respective countries in a special edition. Um, and the countries included Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United States and Brazil. And this work arose from a number of international meetings over the past several years with members from the International Group for Indigenous Health Measurement, um, as well as people working in official statistics and international agencies. Importantly, previous meetings on how to best measure Indigenous health and the impact of colonisation upon health really highlighted this known invisibility of Indigenous peoples in official data collections, and the result of which placed a collective call to improve global efforts in the collection and the use of data. And I know some people in the room have been at some of those um, meetings as well and been involved in this work. So... There were three overarching international issues that we found. Um, the first primary one is around who is counted, and this includes considerations regarding the definitions of indigeneity and the operationalisation of those definitions, as well as the propensity for um, Indigenous peoples to identify um, if, if, if they are uh, recognised. Um, and two how many people are counted, and this includes issues of the completeness of the coverage and the accuracy of enumeration, as well as methodologies used by national statistical agencies um, to address issues of under and over enumeration. And thirdly, um, it was what is counted and what is counted and measured. And this involves thinking about the development of indicators and measures that encompass Indigenous people's states of events, their values and their understandings. So the importance of accurate data and official statistics arise because individual and collective rights to citizenship can only be fully met with accurate identification and accurate counts in the data. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, recognition is embedded in our right to self-determination. And there are a couple of key articles within the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as well as there are other human rights mechanisms as well, that kind of provides a blueprint for nations to discuss and incorporate Indigenous peoples' rights in the discussion of data and information. We've already seen a couple um, earlier today. Um, the first is regarding the right to identify, where Article 33 um, states that Indigenous peoples have the right to determine their own identity or membership in accordance with their customs and their traditions. Um, it's clear that Article 33 highlights the requirement for self-determination in identification. Um, it should also be noted that it purposefully does not specify a definition of Indigenous peoples. Article 15 states, um, it says that Indigenous peoples have the right to the dignity, diversity of their cultures, traditions, histories and aspirations, which shall be appropriately reflected in education and public information. It's this public information statement at the bottom that's really critically important when it comes to official reporting. So the conversation about the context of Indigenous data is, is often a challenging one to have, but at its core it's better in, under, it, it's better in, in taking a, an understanding of these issues. Um, so most official data collected by governments on Indigenous peoples is developed within a colonial and racialised context. And what this resulted in is often colonisers sanctioned forms of recognition 
Uh, what do I mean by this? Well, while the recognition of identity, so who we are, can be achieved by Indigenous peoples for Indigenous peoples, we need to be cognizant that the recognition of indigeneity within data has historically been granted by governments. So as an example, the Australian government officially counted Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from 1901 to 1967 for the sole purpose of excluding us from the national population count. And it was the 1967 referendum that resulted in changes to sections 51 and 127 of the constitution. Um, and it was the change to section 127 that resulted in the inclusion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the census. And this inclusion only arose from the nation's moral imperative to include and count Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And this was, this was via a de democratic vote. And further, it wasn't until 1978 um, that the Commonwealth definition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people was developed. And then further, it wasn't until 1996 that the operationalization of that definition, the standard Indigenous question in the official capacity was officially implemented. And so these developments were done in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peak bodies and community control organisations. Um, and it also happened with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership and, and advice. And I'm, I'm sure that some people in the room were at the table um, during some of those periods too. Um, but with that said, it doesn't distract from the issue that the starting point in terms of our recognition and our starting point within this data is within this power differential. And, and we need to be really aware that we were basically allowed to be counted so just getting into the counts now as well um, as a quick example of issues with the counts um, this is the birth registration example so Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander births within a number of states and territories are critically underreported, and this isn't new news in Australia. Um, we know that there are large numbers of births missing from official statistics used for reporting purposes. Um, to identify the issue of birth registration underestimation, um, uh, yeah, underestimation, there are two primary data sets that are used. Um, one is the perinatal data collection, and this holds information about obstetrics, delivery, and perinatal outcomes. And this data is collected from each state and territory. It's collected from midwives and other staff who use information collected, um, and it's collected from mothers or, or, or families or, or carers um, and hospital records. Um, and the second is the birth registrations data collection, which is the information given to a state or territory registry of births, deaths and marriages. And this is usually by the parents after birth. Um, the data captured by registries can vary by state and territory, which can also, in, in terms of what's collected on, on the piece of paper, and this can impact consistency as well. Um, so nationally, we know there, there's almost 5% underestimation of births when linked to the perinatal data collection. However, when this is looked at by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander status, um, these rates increase to 17% and 18% underestimation or under registration in Queensland and Western Australia, um, respectively. Um, further, if this is looked at by remoteness, the proportion of under registration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies in remote and very remote areas is up to 23.4% and 27% for Queensland and Western Australia. So these estimates of under-registration show that one in every four Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies born in remote and very remote areas don't effectively exist. Um, what does this mean? Well, it means that anyone using birth registrations for the purposes of official statistics reporting is getting it wrong. Um, it, it's also why there have been different statistical methodologies used when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander birth registration data should be used for things like life, life expectancy estimates. It basically complicates things more um, analytically. But what do we do about it? Well, birth registrations enable the right of citizenship to be enacted. Everything from a Medicare card to a passport is the result of having your birth registered. Um, and this requires working with the registrars in state and territory jurisdictions to ensure that all of our babies are registered. In terms of official reporting, 
the good news is in Australia with the move towards data sharing capabilities, um, we'll be able to pick up those people who access services through data linkage, something that researchers have been doing here for a little while now. Um, but it isn't just about handing over information about us and getting the counts right. It's about ensuring governments, official statistical agencies and research can work to support Indigenous peoples and our collective goals and our aspirations. And so I'm just going to quickly pull some of this stuff together that we've, we've heard today. Um, we'll conceptualise it through this diagram. Uh, firstly, that the recognition of Indigenous peoples in data requires the acknowledgement of Indigenous peoples. And it also includes how Indigenous peoples are described and defined. This should be in alignment with the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, and also other national um, um, existing frameworks as well. While Australia does quite well relative to other nations in regards to data capture and recognition within systems, um, the way in which data can support our right to self-determination and com community advancement still has a long way to go. Um, so we need much more improvement in that sphere. We also need to talk about operations and how do we best build data assets and infrastructures and technologies, um, as well as the necessary capabilities of the current and next generation of data nerds. So the Darren's in the room and teaching that next generation to and through. Um, we also need to recognise who are setting the priorities regarding the data use um, and, and the health and wellness measurement to benefit the aspirations of Indigenous people and communities. We need to always be asking the question, who are the we in this discussion? When it comes to linked population level data and official reporting, who should be representing whom? And finally, we need to focus on monitoring. How are we doing? Where should we be focusing our resources? Um, it's dependent on who's doing the monitoring and what that information is being used for. Again, it comes down to priority setting um, and who's making those decisions. And look, we don't have the answers to all of these questions, um, but some of the work we're currently doing will help support and guide these issues into the future. And I guess that the challenges in the data sphere are complex and they're multifaceted, they're dynamic, and we need all hands on deck and all assistance that we can get. Um, so, and I, I think with this, we also need to be a little bit like water and we need to be adaptable to change as, as, as it arises as well. So I, I think that some of the answers lie in directing the conversation towards evidence-based Indigenous data governance, and this is to be guided by community-led data sovereignty principles. Um, and that is ensuring that there are functional mechanisms of voice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities in regards to how data is collected and used across all systems that collect, link and retain data for the purposes of official reporting and research. Um, and, yeah, I, I think I'll leave it there for now. Um, but, yeah, uh, happy to. Thanks, Kalisa. Um, we're, we're almost at the end of this session, but we do have some time for questions. I'll just um, move to the view where I can see all of you. If you press on participants, you can raise your hand. I'm just scanning to see if anyone has a question. Um, no hands. There were some questions in the chat that have been responded to, but I'd just like to go back to Marcia Langton and James Rose and the notion of data as an asset and the contest for assets. We know with land that that's heavily contested. Um, and you touched on how data is used like land for profit. Um, how do you think both in Australia and internationally we're doing with um, managing the issue around control of data as an asset for Indigenous people? Marcia, would you like to respond first? Well, I'll just say something very brief and then hand over to James. Sandra, I think what we're involved in is, a, is a, uh, an experiment to uh, answer exactly that question. Um, and I... But I'm very encouraged by the uh, the willingness of 
the Australian Bureau of Statistics and the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare to partner with us. Um, and they understand perfectly well uh, what our approach is. Uh, and I think they're quite excited by it. So I think we might have, uh, you know, breached the, uh, the colonial barricades, uh, as it were. Thanks, uh, you know, the, that is the big question. And, and, you know, we are yet to find out. Um, James, what do you think? Well, thanks, Marcia. No, I, I agree. I think we have breached the barricades. Um, there have been sufficiently uh, landscape changing adjustments in um, the way data is understood and the way that it's governed in the last 10 to 15 years that have really been unavoidable. And because uh, government agencies and organisations and community controlled organisations of the scale of the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, Empowered Communities, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, are populated by experts in this field who are keeping up to date with best practice um, and uh, international uh, benchmarks around data governance. As Marcia says, we have willing and very, very enthusiastic and capable partners um, in this domain to work with. And so really a lot of our work now is focused on harmonizing the discussion that is happening nationally and internationally and welcoming other um, more unfamiliar participants into the discussion to help contribute their expertise and experiences. So yeah, we, we do, um, we are crossing a very, very important threshold. Thanks, James. And I noticed Jennifer Walker in the, um, in the chat has, has a link around the Canadian principles around OCAP ownership, control, access and possession. So in each of our different countries, we're grappling with, with this as a major threshold issue. There was one last question. Uh, we won't, we'll try not to go over time, but Kathleen Foster has asked Darren Clinch about um, uh, grappling with the challenges of boundaries and um, catchment areas for government versus the real boundaries for communities. Kathleen, did you want to expand on that question or happy to go to Darren? I'm happy for you to go to Darren, Sandra. I think, yeah, just the real practical things for services. Thanks, Kathleen. Darren? Yeah, um, yeah it was a great question, Kathleen. Um, and uh, with the way that you um, can create boundaries or catchment zones, I mean, obviously, if you look at the map that um, uh, Marcia showed with the, the language areas, there's still, you know, real issues about some of those language areas, uh, not including some of the subgroups as well. So if you have an Aboriginal organisation, it should be up to them to dictate what catchment they want to look at. So do they look at their patient list and go, let's create a catchment that includes every single postcode of every patient that's used our service? But um you know, that would obviously create lots and lots of crossover. But um, as I've mentioned in there, and I'll bring this up now, the Indigenous Data Network have an um, MOU with an organisation called Winyama, and Winyama run the Indigenous Mapping Workshop. So I've included the link in the chat so you can have a look. So it is something that we, we, we really started to get the idea of how powerful it is when you use GIS and health data or not, not just health data, but any other data. So you've got spatial and aspatial being joined together to create that, um, that concept of who do we service um, and, and where they're coming from and what are the difficulties that they're having at actually getting to places. And it's probably highlighted even more so by the COVID-19. But yeah, um, if we can get lots and lots more Aboriginal people getting GIS skills, but a GIS as an add-on to their existing skills I think we're going to see a lot more of that kind of stuff coming out. So, yeah. Super exciting, Darren. Yes, and very much. I'm a map nerd. Sorry. We're almost out of time, but just one last question from Judith Katzenellen Bogan. Yeah. It, it was really not a question. Well, it is a question. It might, uh, we, we've been doing similar maps, but again, um, when you have quite small numbers, the ethics of putting it is, is an issue. So we've been going for the uh, Indigenous region 
uh, category sort of, and, and, we, and that's quite useful. But I like Darren's idea of then superimposing that on the language groups. That's new. So we don't stick with one. You might not have the estimates for the language groups, but then people can see where it is. So that might be a combination of sort of a classical SLA or whatever it is that would SA2 uh, on top of that so that people can see where they would fit in in that count without sort of the data breaching of, of small numbers. So thank you for that, Darren. Great. Thank you, Judith. And uh, I'd like to thank all of the presenters for this session, Professor Marcia Langton, James Rose, Darren Clinch, Kristen Smith and Kalinda Griffiths, and thank the Indigenous Data Network for Australia for their participation in this first session. We will go to a break now. Um, it's 11, well, whatever the time is, um, we're due to come back at 11.40 Australian Eastern Daylight Time. Um, so thank you everyone and we'll be back shortly. Thanks, uh, Zara. You, yeah, me.
Hello, everyone. Um, I can't quite tell how many people are back from the break, but I'll assume you're all back from the break. Um, and um, we'll start the second session, session two, which is shorter than the first session, lasts about 55 minutes. And we do aim to have more audience interaction in this session, uh, about 50-50, hopefully. Um, I'm co-presenting this session with um, my colleague, Jocelyn Jones. We're both based here on Wajuk Noongar country in Perth, Western Australia. Um, and the session is titled Methods of Engaging and Partnering um, with Communities. Um, what we're aiming to do is look at what does a good mixed methods study look like in an Aboriginal community? How can this com be combined with data linkage? And we aim to uh, get you to workshop at least one question in breakout rooms. And we aim to provide an example of a study, the use of a study reference group and translation into communities. Um, so I'll hand over to Jocelyn Jones. Are you there, Jocelyn? Okay, Jocelyn. So if you want to screen share and start this first part of our um, session, and I, I might need you to, I'm not sure if I can control the slides that we're sharing, so... We'll see how we go. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Sandy. Um, first, I'm just going to start off with um, a definition of what a mixed method, what mixed methods research is, um, by Creswell, who's a well-known um, qualitative um, researcher. So, um, mixed methods research is an approach to inquiry that combines or associates both qualitative and quantitative forms of research. It involves just philosophical assumptions, the use of qualitative and quantitative approaches and the mixing of both approaches in a study. So um, we'll be just talking a little bit about um, how we will be, how we will use that um, approach with data linkage. So um, I'm sure you all know what, um, what data linkage is, um, but this is a definition from one of our um, WA data um, gurus, um, Darcy Holman. Um, he um, identified, he defined um, data linkage as the bringing together um, of two or more different data sources and that data that relates to the same individual family place or event. Um, this is just a, a quick um, a sort of a visual of the data linkage um, system um, that we have in WA. And as you can see, um, we have, um, it can collect information on whole of government. And then um, we have the WA data linkage branch, which is responsible for linking that, that data um, to um, for research projects. And as you can see, it's it's um, it's got a wealth of information in there. But obviously, we still have some of the um, similar issues that have been identified earlier about identification and quality of data. Um, yes, yeah, so those sorts of issues that have already been raised and will be raised in other sessions after us. Um, so. Um, it was already been touched on about the um, the six key principles of data linkage being developed by the, um, the Australian Institute of um, Health and Welfare. Um, so the principle one is the values and ethics in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander re research. That's already been discussed. Um, principle two, the quality of Indigenous status information in the data collections. Principle three, um, the quality of link linkage variables. Um, Principle four, the assessment of, quali of quality of data linkage. Five, methods for der deriving Indigenous status. And six, um, for transparency. Um, we're just going to discuss two of those principles and I'll just hand you over to Sandy for the first slide. Um, so that principle one is values and ethics in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research in Australia. Um, it covers... It originates from um, 
the National Health and Medical Research Council um, ethics principles, and they were developed um, almost 20 years ago with um, large-scale consultation and involvement and leadership of Aboriginal people in Australia. Um, so all, everyone involved in data linkage research in Australia um, through these and the Code of Conduct for Research in Australia has a responsibility to abide by these principles. And these principles, um, the, it should be applied to the conception of the data linkage uh, work, the design process for studies and the conduct, the implementation of uh, that research, uh, including um, the production of reports and the publication of papers and the translational uh, processes, they should be gu guided by these NH and MRC core values and ethics of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander human research. The next slide, Jocelyn. Uh, the other principle, um, well, major issue to raise is, is um, the involvement of community and consumers. Um, so in some cases, this involves a consumer involvement is, is, is another, I suppose, way of looking at the involvement of Indigenous people, but it does have um, overlap with other um, advocacy groups that are involved in, in involving people, um, the community and people in, uh, of interest in, in research. Um, but this can involve Aboriginal community controlled organisations and researchers, um, particularly working in partnership to identify um, and frame the research priorities and their desired policy and practice translation um, resulting from, from the, the overall research program. We've got child protection, child removal research that at the moment that where we're working hard around framing the original research, implementing the program and really trying to understand how to leverage the data and produce the policy and practice um, change, but also to put some of that data into the hands of, um, uh, of Aboriginal community controlled organisations in Western Australia. Um, these partnerships should be genuine partnerships that are respectful and sensitive to the needs of the community um, and not an administrative um, ticker box exercise, but um, should really be pushing to be sensitive, genuine partnerships that are respectful and sensitive. Um, they also highlight involving the community and consumers as part of the research development from the onset. The origination, the, the, the original discussion of the potential questions, the potential issues that are of that are of concern and the responsibility of communities, Indigenous communities, um, and not just government, um, rather than a, a more paternalistic, patronising approach to this research um, with Indigenous researchers or communities being asked to com comment on the research once the research has commenced and um, is well underway. And it goes to the difficult question of conducting research that the community wants. We're all used to driving research from within the academy, within universities, within government, um, but really challenging ourselves um, to go beyond that and to really understand what research and what information and how to um, work with communities to mine data and put the data um, before communities for their own advocacy and um, action purposes, not just ours. Um, and one mechanism is to ensure that a community advisory group, including consumers, is established to oversee and advise the research and guide and direct. And there's always a tension between giving advice versus actually having control. So we, we clearly see control and decision making to be a part of that process of involving um, Indigenous people in linked data research. 
Thanks, Jocelyn. Next, I think it's back to you. Okay. Um, oh, it's, it's actually yours, but... <laughs> oh, okay. And transparency. <laughs> um, transparency is important in in good, pra good research practice, but it's also important um, as it underpins partnerships. Um, transparency that's relevant to all aspects of data linkage um, activity so that um, uh, Indigenous stakeholders and owners um, are involved in and understand um, the management of data linkage quality assessments, the analysis of linked data that they actually use their understanding to inform the framing of the analysis of linked data, um, the methods of deriving Indigenous status. Um, these shouldn't really be the domain of the academy, whether or not there are Indigenous people in the academy, they should be things that are fully disclosed and discussed with, um, with, with sovereign nations and, and Indigenous people who are the owners of, data, of, of the data, and they uh, should be fully documented and publicly reported and not just kept internal. Thanks, Jocelyn. Okay, so the next slide um, outlines an exa the example of a mixed methods um, research des um, design. Uh, this is from my PhD studies. So the overarching aim, um, so I'm just going to go through the steps um, that I've taken and how I've used the voices of um, these young people to inform um, the the um, the analysis and the questions for the data linkage um, part of the part of this. Um, so um, the first thing that I did was um, establish an Aboriginal community advisory group, um, which was um, as Sandy said, it's a, a group to oversee and advise your your research. Um, the advisory group. Um, included policy makers, elders, young people, um, people from um, representatives from Aboriginal community controlled and corrective services. Um, so the aim of the, um, the overarching aim of, of my PhD was to document the lived experiences of Aboriginal youth and identify significant life events and issues that were important to them. So um, how I collected that data um, in phase one. So um, obviously it was important to uh, make sure that the um, young people had their voices about, um, you know, about their life experiences. And I also wanted to um, identify um, the trajectories in their life and where they felt they needed more support and um, where some pathways went off um, negative and where some pathways were positive and what were some of the issues and supports that they had around those. So first of all, in relation to the qualitative data collection, um, with, I worked with eight young people and they, they each developed a timeline. So that was a timeline that started from birth and followed them up to the age they, that they were currently at. So I had young people between 14 to 21 so in that in that lifeline, they identified <clears throat> significant life events that had happened to them. Um, a lot of that was in relation to, you know, we had children that had been uh, subjected to physical abuse, um, sexual assaults, um, for, you know, um, get, having contact with the justice system, um, being suspended from school. So they identified all those um, those um, life events on a timeline. Running at the same time as that, um, I used photo voice because um, I found that um, a lot of them had, um, you know, when they did the timeline, it seemed to focus a lot on sort of the negative impacts, um, which was, yeah, which was part of what I wanted to do. But also I wanted to um, them to um, highlight positive um, aspects of their life experiences. So they used photo. So we used photo voice, and they were um, able to take photos of things that were important to them, um, and um, we linked those with the lifeline. 
And then from that, I did semi-structured interviews. So I was able to develop a narrative or a story, a, a story for each of those young people. And um, so they were quite proud that they, you know, produced their own stories and they read them back and they shared them with their families. Um, and I think a lot of their families um, weren't really aware of how some of these, some of the young people were with were, um, were feeling and what some of the what had happened to them in their lives. So um, that was um, it was quite um, emotional and sensitive in some ways for them. Um, so um, so anyway, so when we um, analysed all those pieces of information, the main issues that came up um, that I was going to use to explore um, the data in the data that I could. So. Um, the first key um, um, issue was complexity of family. A lot of young people um, had negative, you know, negative experiences with family and positive. They wanted to be around their family, but they were all also aware of some of the negative stuff that their family was, you know, the peer pressure from family to do, um, you know, to do um, negative things. Um, drugs and alcohol was a, um, a big issue as well and experiences with the justice, uh, juvenile justice system and the impact of child protection services on their life. So <clears throat> once I had those results, so those um, four key areas, I was able to um, look, at, look at the data that I, ha I had access to and pose some of those, um, those questions um, to that data. So I used the um, data from the WA data um, linkage system. So I used midwives, death, intellectual disability um, data, child protection data, education and juvenile justice data. And I was able to explore more those, the, their experiences around juvenile justice and child protection issues in that data. So I thought it was important that the voices and um, the issues that were important to those young people formed the, the key component of the data, of my data, um, a data analysis using the linked data. And um, yeah, so that was all fed back to the community and in relation to translation, um, still working on um, a policy translation, um, looking at um, better support for um, children who are in the justice system and the child protection system. And, um, developed it up with another uh, collaboration with Uni New South Wales, a, um, a study looking at the mental health and sexual health um, issues for um, young people who've had contact with the juvenile justice system. So, and obviously there was, um, we had community feedback and um, community had input into um, the next project that we worked on. So what are some of the um, strengths of mixed methods um, to give meaning to the lives of disadvantaged, marginalised groups through the use of their voices and experiences? To better understand the research problem by triangulating the broader um, numeric trends from qualitative, uh, quantitative research with the details and richness of qualitative research. Um, so it's sort of, it's giving a stronger evidence um, for, your research, for your research results. Um, to explore participant views and experiences with the intent of examining those these further with large population samples. Some of the limitations, um, we probably all work with data linkage and we know that it takes a lot of time and resources to be able to, um, to get access and then to work with it. Um, you need to know whether the research team have the necessary skill set to utilise a mixed methods approach. Um, interpreting um, results back to the community um, can be challenging. There's always there's such a lot of information, um, so it's important important that you work with your Aboriginal group um, advisory group um, to ensure that the way you're feeding back that communication and um, the results is meaningful to the community and they understand um, what the outcomes of that research was. 
Okay, over to you, Sandy. Thanks, Jocelyn. So now's the time for the grand experiment, see if uh, we can make the work breakout sessions work. I'm not quite sure how this will work, um, but we've got um, till we've got a, a session which is how long is this, Bridget? 20 minutes? Uh, the breakout session or the entire rest of the session? The breakout, yeah. Um, the breakouts. So, yeah, we um, had, it can be, I was going to ask you 15 or 20 minutes, so how, um, and then the rest oh, of the okay. time. Oh, okay. So, so roughly 15 minutes we'll, we'll be able to send a reminder into the rooms. We've got four facilitators for each of the rooms, jo myself, Jocelyn Jones, Darren Clinch and Kalinda Griffiths. But our job as facilitators is to be there and to make sure there's a there's a scribe and there's a spokesperson in each room. And we want the scribe and the spokesperson to do the work, but we're there as a backup to help. Um, and when you come back, there's time for each of the spokespersons to, to briefly over um, let three to five minutes um, present the work of each group. Um, so, we did, Jocelyn, can you share that screen again? Yeah, it's up. Um, I think it's gone down. Can you see it? No, um, but each of, I've emailed the, the slide to each of the, the leaders for the breakout rooms. So once you go to the breakout room, there is a, there is a project that where you need to design a study so discuss amongst yourself how, how to design a mixed method study addressing the issue which is related to pregnant Indigenous women in prison. Jocelyn, that was the research question. Was that was. right? Yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't share again, so. Okay. Um, and so there's lots of scope to say what the aims, the methods, the analysis and results and translation might be from that project. Um, and it's very broad. We don't mind if you all take the same approach or you take very different approaches. There's only 15 minutes. So um, I'll direct you to the to the breakout room. So Bridget, how do people... Uh, so I'll start those now and hopefully everyone should automatically be allocated into a room um, and I'll have a look and if you check. So if there's any um, problems, uh, just please ask, ask the question uh, in the main room. So I'll start that now. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. Uh, now I thought that uh, so I covered a previous one. Okay, I'm um, opening the rooms now. So Bridget, do we? How do we get to the rooms? Are we automatic? Uh, I think you've been allocate. I think the IT people said they'd allocated the facilitators to the rooms, but otherwise, um, let's see. Um, There's thirty unassigned. people online. I just can't see where we're. How we? Oh, hang on. There's a lot of unassigned people. Sorry. So I thought this was. Uh, I'll assign you to room one, Sandra. Um, oh, I think this is our room, is it? Oh, no. All right. Um, I'll do you first, Justin. Sorry, I thought those were pre assigned. Um, Justin to room two. Uh, Uh,
sorry. Uh,
Wow, very neat. <laughs> we didn't get it. I didn't even have to move. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm glad to see everyone's come back okay. Apologies if there was partial messages being broadcast. Um, <laughs> they, they went through before I <laughs> had finished typing. And I'm just drinking coffee at home. <laughs> yeah, that went super fast. We were only just starting to get warmed up. Yeah. <laughs> I think the online format has reduced our, our timing for a moment. <laughs> it's very efficient online form. It's very efficient, I must say. <laughs> um, so I think everyone's back. That was a that was a, a very um, big exercise in time management and trying to delegate and participate. And I hope Everyone had at least um, some, into, every room had some international participants. So I'll just start with our group um, because I know what, what we've decided. And we, we've asked Jennifer Walker from Canada to feedback some of the thoughts that flowed through from our group. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, yeah, thanks. It's really nice, uh, nice to have this opportunity. Um, so, you know, our group... Um, had a lot to talk about actually. So we, um, we talked about the importance of having um, an advisory group that, that had meaningful um, participation and voice um, from the pregnant women um, in the setting. Um, we talked about a lot of the ethical issues and considerations of power dynamics with, um, with the women um, because of the setting. Um, because of the, the um, you know, the fact that they, um, we ha you know, we'd have to make sure that there were, um, uh, you know, it, there was opportunity for them to participate without coercion and, and um, in ways that maintained their privacy. Um, so we, we had quite a lot of discussion about that and, and the involvement along the way and how best to involve people. We talked about... Um, the importance, um, so I'm, I'm not doing this in a super structured way, uh, but we talked about um, the kinds of questions that would be best um, uh, answered, like the sub research questions that would be best answered um, using qualitative methods um, and really understanding people's experiences, those women's experiences um, and, uh, and the importance of in, having that as as a key part of the methods. Um, we talked about, uh, you know, there was a suggestion that maybe journey mapping um, people's experiences along the way that would also help drive us to understand which um, data linkage, um, uh, you know, what variables, what sources of data might be helpful um, to answer quantitative questions um, would also be useful. The other, and so that merging of the quantitative and the qualitative, so it wasn't, um, and the mixed methods so that um, they really worked together. And the last thing I'll say before I <laughs> see if anyone else has things that I missed um, is just this, the importance of um, understanding who governs and how the governance works for the data, the quantitative data and the administrative data that you might be accessing. So if it's justice data or, um, or, or um, Indigenous governed data um, to help identify Indigenous um, women. Um, just those, uh, you know, the processes and understanding those processes and building time in and, and effort in for that. Um, so I'm sure there are things I missed from my group if, if anyone wants to uh, uh, pitch in a little bit. Thanks, Jennifer. That was terrific, you know, drawing out of some of the major points from our discussion. Um, was any, is there anything anyone from the group would like to add briefly before we move on to the next group? No? Okay, we'll move on to the group that Kalinda Griffiths shared. Kalinda, can you find a way to feedback from your group? I, I've got Ben Harrop who's going to feedback. He got dobbed in off the bar because he was first in the room, so I'll oh, hand it over. Um... <laughs> Damn you, NBN, and your fast internet connection. No, um, I'll, I'll try my best. Um, a lot of this is very new to me, so there's a lot of discussion about things I hadn't thought of before, so 
people from my team, if there's something I missed, please bring it up. Um, so in terms of, we try to identify the main outcomes of interest and then sort of use that to flow onto the design of the study. So we sort of identified two main um, outcomes for the study, and that was the psychosocial needs of the pregnant women. And that could be things such as their mental health um, or things like family visitation. Uh, and also the medical or obstetric needs of the women as well. Um, and I guess part of that is to understand maybe are these needs being met by the current service provision in the prison or not? Um, and methods of trying to examine these outcomes that we came up with were using semi-structured interviews and yarning circles with uh, pregnant women and also semi-structured interviews with the service providers in the prisons. Um, and that was sort of the qualitative component and then the quantitative component. We were thinking we could use de-identified medical record data from the prison and maybe if it's possible, link that with um, medical the medical data for women or the children after release and have a look at the perinatal outcomes of the children to see perhaps how the um, service provision or the health of the women in the prison uh, perhaps relates to the, yeah, the perinatal outcomes. Um, what else have I got here? I think that's, that's all I've got in my notes here. If anyone else has anything to add? Maybe Ben, thanks. That was a good overview. Just um, to sort of clarify that obviously with the, um, the link data follow up or the sort of um, uh, use of the quantitative medical clinic records in prison, that's obviously done with consent. So the idea was that um, uh, it would be a mixed method, sort of an integrated mixed method study, because there's op there's the option to do a data linkage study, but then get, you know, sort of um, a separate sort of group uh, of different people together to then qualitatively interview to flesh out uh, or di dig down into um, sort of the results that were coming out of the quantitative analysis or do it all together on the one group, which is to qualitatively interview um, and, you know, sort of undertake the sort of focus groups or yarning circles. But then in addition to that, get voluntary consent to link their data in a de-identified fashion so that you then have quantitative follow-up on the exact same people who have provided the qualitative, more granular uh, sort of uh, information. So just that minor clarification. Thanks, David, Ben and Kalinda. Um, we might move on to the next group, uh, the group led by Darren Clinch. Hi, um, there, uh, so we've I've got um, Claire Bradley, who's going to be our spokesperson, um, and we've tried to uh, get the, as much uh, information passed over to her so she can talk. So over to you, Claire. Thanks, Darren. Yeah, um, our group, we're quite focused on the data part of it. I think we're all kind of quantitative researchers rather than qualitative researchers in the background. So we were looking at um, being able to uh, kind of measure the pre-existing comorbidities and social determinants of health kind of thing for uh, the whole population, as well as um, the women that are currently in, in, in custody. Uh, looking at markers of kind of like, uh, infant, in the infant cohort, um, looking at uh, data that already exists um, describing that, looking at prenatal care arrangements um, that exist in custodial facilities already. Um, and then we kind of moved along to um, a less data focus and more onto a kind of qualitative aspect of it. Uh, trying to uh, get some sort of measure of evaluation of cultural norms um, and the importance of dehomogenizing um, Aboriginal population. You know, these women have very uh, would come from very different geographies, from different um, uh, social groups and family groups, and um, being in uh, probably a long way away from their families. And if they're currently pregnant now, that's all quite a um, you know, a, a recent thing for them, they might be looking for a, a, at, a, at a short sentence and getting used to that, or they might be getting used to a very long sentence and really getting uh, down to the, the, the nitty gritty of, of the different types of women that would be represented in this group rather than treating them as, as one whole group. Um, so that kind of led us from a very kind of quantitative thing, circling back to the kind of qualitative beginnings of a project, which is to first and foremost go 
to Aboriginal women in custody and ask them what their concerns are and to be able to kind of set the scene for any data analysis that move forward. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Darren. Great points. Darren, was there anything else your group wanted to add briefly before I move on to the final group? Um, I, I would certainly open up to the group, uh, particularly um, just pointing out that I, I apologise for making it more of a quant focus, but <laughs> that's kind of my field as well. But uh, Lisa um, or anybody else from the group would like to add a point. I think Claire did a great job of uh, summing it up. Uh, Darren's definitely going to uh, make a map and <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do some geospatial analysis going, going with the strengths. Uh, no, yeah, thanks. It was. Very, I, I really feel like the other groups had more time than we did because I, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> how we, how you got through so much. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, a lot of the really the kind of strong epi and ensuring that we're um, bringing the cross representation of indigenous and non indigenous populations to um, strengthen the message of those measures of effect that. Um, differ across different population groups. So um, really adding strengths to any sort of policy and practice change measures. So yeah, making sure that all pregnant women in hospital, not just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander pregnant women in custody would be um, evaluated in that, uh, in that research. Great, thanks. thanks. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Lisa. We'll move on to the final group. Um, led by Jocelyn Jones. Um, Holly Richmond is going to report back. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, so we initially started our uh, discussion talking about the need for focus groups um, and yarning circles, potentially with pregnant women in custody, but also looking at um, having some qualitative outcomes from um prison workers, the carers for children in prisons, as well as potentially community elders, um, sorry, Aboriginal elders, and um, then potentially using that to outline the needs for pregnant women in custody. But then um, similarly to what Ben and da uh, David are talking about, having potentially medical and social services records from the prisons and um, looking at what quantitative data we could collect from those. But then the discussion also led to talking about potentially having a prospective cohort through, um, through the prison population and following those pregnant women. But then I think probably what was um, interesting is we were talking about the potential to have a program as an outcome from the research. So trying to meet the needs of these pregnant women in custody and potentially having a data linkage component to that to kind of pre and post evaluate how that program would work and how well the program is potentially meeting the needs that have been outlined for pregnant women in custody. Um, if anyone from the group would like to elaborate, I'm not sure how much time um, we have to discuss, but I think what's important is having those um, lived experiences from different people or different um, aspects of what, how we can meet the needs of pregnant women in custody, but then also having some really good outcomes from the research in some sort of program or intervention. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, and great job from all of the groups. We, we are out of time. I think even though that was a challenging exercise across international borders and, um, and, and across multiple sites here in Australia. Um, almost all of the, the, the major themes um, in a mixed method study came through. We're going to a break now. It's a 10 minute break. We'll have um, the, the visual, the holding slide with the graphic recordings uh, up there for everyone to see. But if you could all come back in 10 minutes for the last session, session three, which runs for about 45 minutes. And then we've got a wrap up by Professor Marcia Lampton in the final 20 minutes. Thank you all uh, for your participation and we'll see you soon. Thanks.
Hi, everyone. Um, we'll just all get back online and start the final session. Can everyone hear me? Great. My computer's telling me I can't be heard. Um, Kalinda Griffiths is the chair for this session. So, Kalinda, if it's okay with you, I'll hand over to you for this session. Yeah, no worries, Sandra. Thank you. Okay, so um, welcome to session three, um, where we start to drill down a little into the analytical side of things. And we're going to look a bit closer at some of the methodological considerations when using data to understand and address the health and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, again, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting here today. And I would like to pay my respects to all elders, those of the past, the present and the future. Um, this is going to be a bit of a fast paced session. Um, and we've got three presenters, Bridget McNamara, Alison Gibbard and Carrington Shepherd, And they're going to be covering two primary topics. Um, the first topic will be on Indigenous identification and improving data quality through data linkage. And the second topic is developing indicators where Indigenous values and understandings are captured and how data linkage can be used to potentially tell a deeper story. I'm just going to share my screen very quickly. Um, okay, that's up. Um, and so we would like um, this session to be an opportunity for all of us to learn from each other um, and to hear about some of the metho methodological approaches um, that you guys take to address measurement issues in the use of linked data. Um, primarily, though, the aims of this session are to understand the value, the gaps and the limitations and um, data quality when working with linked data. And I think that that question was posed at the very beginning of the workshop as well. Um, and also to identify and discuss some of those methodological approaches. Um, obviously, we're not going to get through it all, um, which is why the focus is on the two topics. Um, we're, we've also got um, Kathleen Bolster and David Crane uh, as our other experts in this session. Um, so along with um, the other presenters, as well as yourselves, I think we've got uh, quite a wealth of knowledge um, and, and nerdy knowledge um, in the room um, to answer some of the, the big questions. Um, so. Please put your questions in the chat as well. Um, and, and the plan is that Kathleen will, will kind of um, uh, uh, farm this or field it. Um, and you may have already received a, an email um, or you should have already received an email. So if you if you thought of any questions as well, please feel free to, to um, put through uh, those questions as well. But I'll, I'll pass on now um, to Bridget and Alison. Um, and I do hope you like my slide there. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Linda. Cool. So I will try and be um, as fast paced as possible with this. Um, but we're talking about Indigenous status and how it's um, measured in linked data. Uh, and I believe, Alison, uh, the slides have just gone down. Are you able to share that screen again, um, please? So linked data offers both opportunities and challenges when trying, when identifying Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, within the linked data sets, uh, where you have multiple records uh, that have an Indigenous status for the same person. And as I think we've heard um, quite a bit, uh, and particularly Kalinda's talk in the first session, uh, it's very important to have accurate and complete identification of Aboriginal people uh, within the data. Uh, for, for many reasons, but for mainly for human rights, everyone has the right to be counted. It provides evidence for policy and service de um, decisions and resourcing decisions, and also affects the accuracy of the inferences that we're making um, within research. So in Australia, um, briefly, most uh, Indigenous status in, linked, in the linked administrative data in health and other settings is collected um, through self-identification in some way. Uh, this, um, this is only sort of one component um, of sort of the common legislative definition which, look, uh, which um, talks of uh, dissent, uh, self-identification and community acceptance. But as we've heard, there's a much broader context um, to, and consideration. Sure. 
the collection of uh, of uh, Indigenous status Sorry. in the different data sets. Bridget, just one sec. Can I ask yeah. everyone just to mute, mute, please, just because there's feedback occurring? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yep. So um, it can vary quite quite considerably through um, the different uh, different data sets, and this depends on the way the data is collected, but also the intent of the data collection. And so it can depend on whether the how or whether the person's asked the question directly, um, the data collection fields, and also the priority or importance that's placed on collecting this data within that particular setting. And so it does vary between health and other types of data, for example, child protection. Um, and the uh, Indigenous status that we collect in different data sets also is, is affected by individual choice. So individuals have the right to identify or not identify, depending on the circumstances and the perceived risks and advantages in that setting. So both the quality of the data collection and uh, individuals' propensity to identify have changed over time. And this means the data um, that's captured has also changed over time. So data linkage can help with the problem of under enumeration of Indigenous people within a single data set. But if information from multiple data sets is used, it may be conflicting. So how do researchers decide whether to classify someone as Indigenous or non-Indigenous for the purpose of the research? So a range of approaches are currently taken in Australia, including applying algorithms to the linked data. Um, so a couple were mentioned earlier today, the use of the ever Aboriginal algorithm, um, a majority of records approach. So I'll go through an example that illustrates a couple of these approaches. Um, so a baby was born, for example, 10 years ago when only the indigenous status of the mother was collected. So in this case, the midwife records the baby's mother as Aboriginal. And then the baby's birth is registered by its parents. Um, they self-report that they are not Aboriginal. So most of the algorithms in use in Australia today would at this point classify the baby as Aboriginal to deal with that historical issue of data sets undercounting Aboriginal people. So then the child's admitted to hospital three times and is recorded as non-Aboriginal each time. Um, so at this point, different approaches can end up with this child being categorised differently. So one approach could be to ignore the hospital records totally. Um, on average, sicker children have more hospital records than healthier children. So therefore, they have more opportunities to be recorded as Aboriginal. Um, whether they're Aboriginal or not. Um, and this can lead to differential classification of sicker and healthier children. By contrast, every child should have the birth record and every child can have a birth registration. So if we ignore the hospital records, then this child will probably be categorised as Aboriginal. Or the researchers may want to include the hospital records and use this additional information about the child. And um, as has been talked about earlier, this um, may be particularly important for children where the mother is non-Aboriginal and the father is Aboriginal. Um, so the birth registration, which lists the father's Aboriginal status, um, as Kalinda was talking about, um, you know, many children many Aboriginal children have significant delays in their birth registration. Um, additionally, in both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal birth registrations, father's details are commonly left off the birth registration. So using the hospital records could help capture more of these Aboriginal children who have non-Aboriginal mothers. So one commonly um, used algorithm that was discussed was the ever Aboriginal algorithm. So this approach categorizes a child as Aboriginal if any record at all lists them as Aboriginal. So in this instance, um, the child would be categorized as Aboriginal. So I'll just talk about one other alternative that's commonly used in Western Australia called the multi-stage median algorithm. It's a bit too complicated to go into in detail today, but Basically, for this child, um, the multi-stage median would categorise the child as non-Aboriginal on the basis that two out of the three data sets 
um, lists the child as non-Aboriginal. So this um, approach protects against a small number of false positives. There are many other approaches in use and the best, best method will probably depend on the research question, the data sets that are in use and the cohort itself, in particular, when the cohort was born, um, which affects the quality of the data. So the, the different approaches, uh, sorry, Alison, could I ask uh, just to mute, please? Um, the different approaches do impact the reporting of health outcomes. Uh, so depending on, uh, on the approach, health disparities or disease prevalence can be either increased or uh, or reduced. And similarly, different algorithms may either mask or inflate uh, improvements in health over time. So depending on the way the algorithm is working um, and how it's identifying over time. So the best algorithm for the study um, may differ. So depending if the if it's if the outcome of the study is looking at rates in a population uh, where under enumeration of Aboriginal people may be the main concern. Um, compared to a study of disparities between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people where misclassifying non-Aboriginal people as Aboriginal uh, may, um, may be more of a concern so that you don't end up with a large proportion of non-Aboriginal people within the Aboriginal sample. So just uh, on the slide here, there's just one example from hospital data for adults in New South Wales. And you can see um, the different algorithms on the side, which I won't go into, but you can see how varied the estimates of the relative admission ratio were for Aboriginal to non-Aboriginal, depending on how you identified people within the hospital or mortality data. And this was for injury or cardiovascular disease, and it varied quite substantially. Uh, this, this is an example from a, uh, from a study of, of Western Australian children uh, looking uh, at children born 2000 to 2013. And here we used a number of methods. Firstly, the multi-stage median that Alison mentioned um, and to see how that was working in young children and compared it to the multi-stage median approach for their parents and grandparents uh, and then to using the perinatal records alone. And you can see the differing numbers here. There was considerable overlap between the cohorts However, you can see that the um, methods B and C did identify uh, six to 7,000 more children. So using an ever original definition for the perinatal. Uh, and these uh, additional children did differ in terms of their um, socioeconomic status. For, from higher socioeconomic areas tended to be from less remote, more urban areas and also have um, different, uh, better perinatal outcomes than the, um, the first cohort. But importantly, there are also differences in the Aboriginality of the parents. So these two algorithms identified more children with Aboriginal fathers and non-Aboriginal mothers who were not in the first cohort. So ideally, we'd have high quality questionnaire data, um, which we could link to our administrative data to assess the accuracy of these competing algorithms. Um, but another possibility is to examine how consistently family members are categorised while recognising that some family members may choose to um, identify differently. So in this study, we had a large data set with estimates of 51 to 61% Aboriginal people, different estimates because of the different algorithms we looked at. So we then looked at whether, at whether pairs of full siblings and parent child or triads were categorised consistently. So on this slide, I'm just showing the results from the two possible algorithms I previously talked about, Ever Aboriginal and Modest Stage Median. So on the left, we can see that the Ever Aboriginal results in more inconsistent cases of full sibling pairs. So that's one sibling is categorised by the algorithm as Aboriginal and the other sibling as non-Aboriginal. And on the right, we can see in red that ever Aboriginal also resulted in many more cases where one or both parents were categorised as Aboriginal, but the child was categorised as non-Aboriginal. Um, 
So for this study, we linked four data sets, um, including hospital records. So within the hospital records, each person could have many, many records. Um, and so the ever Aboriginal approach when applied to this many records um, ended up with some, with classifying a number of non-Aboriginal people as Aboriginal, um, which I guess is perhaps becoming more and more relevant today as um, some of the data linkages being done today involve so many data sets. Um, so potentially it's increasingly important that at the algorithms that we use can be robust to a small number of records that misclassify non-Aboriginal people. So that's it from Bridget Knight. And yeah, as Colin just said, interested to hear how everybody else is dealing with these issues. Great. Thanks, Alison and Bridget. We're just going to go straight over to Carrington. Share my screen here, Clinda. Great. Can you see that okay? Excellent. Okay, and sounds all right? Yes. Okay, great. All right, I'll just dive straight into it. Um, just a bit of background first, though. Uh, I'm Carrington Shepherd. I'm a senior research fellow at the Telethon Kids Institute, located uh, on lovely Noongar Wedjoke Budja, or Perth. Um, I'd like to start this, these sort of talks by just uh, mentioning that I am a non-Indigenous person and researcher but I uh, have a very passionate interest in working with and for Aboriginal people, particularly in issues that uh, help in their advocacy with um, uh, issues concerned with Aboriginal children's health. So just as a, as a foregrounder there. Now, this, uh, the purpose of this, the real goal of this topic um, is really just to prompt um, your thoughts uh, in this space. So what have your experiences been in this space? How have you gone about this sort of work? And do you have any ideas for how we can do this stuff better in the future? So um, that's the, the real goal of what we're looking to do here. So. As a starting point in terms of indicators of culture or values or historical determinants of health, typically in Australia, linked data systems have very little information. So that's the starting point with this. This is especially the case when we look at issues of cultural strength or cultural resilience. Uh, there's very limited information, but there's also critical limitations in information on the circumstances associated with social and health inequalities. So I'm talking about issues of racism, and stress, uh, social exclusion, and the other legacies of colonization that are, uh, that are shared experiences of many indigenous cultures. And even for most, uh, I guess, traditional mainstream indicators of socioeconomic constructs, we often have missing or piecemeal information in this space as well, depending of course on the breadth of the data linking system that you're, that you're working with. The typical exception to this is area-based uh, measures of socioeconomic status. We generally have good information on, on this type of uh, topic. And they can provide a pretty good proxy measure of um, material circumstances and social standing, but they generally don't give you much information about the circumstances of individuals within areas, including their education, income, wealth, and other issues. Of course, it's not linked data systems aren't a data desert when it comes to this topic. Um, but um, when we do put the lens on the available data, we, we often need to do it in terms of what is the value of mainstream indicators in uh, in well-being and well-being inequalities in Indigenous contexts. What what value do they have? This isn't a topic that we can that we can uh, discuss in detail here. But of course, we know that um, notions of well-being uh, certainly differ between Indigenous and other cultures. And there's often uh, considerable complexities in defining and measuring uh, Aboriginal conceptions of well-being and their antecedents. So link linked data systems, of course, include information from administrative byproduct sources. They include data that inform government uh, reporting processes as well. Uh, and as such, these data don't necessarily, they're not necessarily acceptable or valued by Indigenous uh, communities. They're not necessarily seen as relevant indicators of their circumstances either. So, I think this in itself underscores um, the critical importance of Aboriginal governance, uh, good Aboriginal governance in supporting uh, any data linkage project, of course, any project more broadly, but has a special relevance in, uh, in Aboriginal data linkage projects. I know these have been covered and have been common themes that were discussed in the earlier sessions, uh, but I just really wanted to reiterate that, uh, that point now. And not following these types of processes, not setting up good governance processes right from the absolute start when you're thinking about a project, uh, of course, runs, runs many risks, not least the fact that um, uh, 
producing uh, work using linked data might uh, reinforce the existing deficit narratives. And I think that's a really critical point. So something we need to keep in front of mind all the time. So. So from my experience, there's a number of ways to uh, use and develop data uh, from link systems that uh, might have some cultural relevance. Uh, this isn't necessarily an exhaustive list, but just an expression of my experiences. The first is, can we, it's really a question, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave, I'll, I'll pose the question and maybe leave the discussion for, for people to, uh, to think about uh, later on and ask some questions and, and give their thoughts. But can we be more creative within the existing linkage framework that we have? Is there data there that we don't that we don't use that we could use to actually explore some of these issue, issues of cultural understanding and cultural values? Um, a lot of my work is about uh, children's health and ch Aboriginal children's health and Aboriginal children's development. Uh, so just as a thought or a, a connection point on this topic, I've been thinking about issues of, of family functioning. We have a breadth of data in West Australian data link systems about from human and social services. Can we actually mine this to, to give some more information about how families function? Can we use information from courts data, from prisons data, from juvenile justice data and other sources to get a meaningful insight about family functioning, perhaps some proxy markers of when parents and caregivers are away from the home and not necessarily looking after their children and those role models aren't existing in the household and a timing of those things and the length of time. So it's just a thought, it's more of a thought as opposed to anything that I've done, but I'll just sort of frame that out here for, for thinking. The second thing I've listed here is, is linking area level information. So, uh, and Darren touched on this earlier, we have good uh, geographic uh, identifiers in linked health data systems in Australia, which is great. So it opens up the opportunity to link at, a, at an area level. Um, so what, what I'm thinking about here is if you've got good information that you've collected, that's culturally relevant at an area, at an aggregate area level. Uh, for example, uh, you may have collected information on indigenous decision-making within a region or within multiple regions. And that in itself might be a reasonable marker of self-determination. Um, and that can be easily linked through geographic, geographic identifiers to existing uh, uh, linked data, uh, assuming of course that uh, it's consistent with your ethical ethical approvals. And from a practical standpoint, it's easy to do. You always make, need to make sure that's in, that it's uh, ethically valid and consistent with your approvals. But the third point here is the one I wanna spend a little bit more time on, um, in, and that is the, uh, the key issue of um, linking to existing survey data sources. So using existing data sources that have been collected uh, um, on the Aboriginal community that have spent a considerable amount of time thinking about issues of culture, and then how they can be linked either retros to retrospective or prospective linked data. And there's been some examples I'll show where that has been done with and without consent. So three examples here, the three I've listed are three large scale Australian uh, surveys of um, Aboriginal circumstances. And I'll touch on the next couple of slides about the first two. Um, they differ in terms of their scope and what they're um, essentially trying to collect, but good examples of information that um, good development and use of uh, cultural information in these surveys as a foundation for then further linkage. I've listed at the bottom the multi-agency data integration project uh, in Australia, and just listing this as an example of how the government, particularly the federal government, are uh, using very large scale data as a possible mechanism to um, support connections with um, some of these explorations of culture and connections to culture. So from what I understand, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the, in terms of the relevance for uh, this particular talk, large scale um, survey data from the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Survey and National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Survey, for example, which do have good information on culture uh, and culturally relevant wellbeing, uh, potentially could be linked to some of these other larger data sources that normally sit in, in their own silos. And that opens up the possibility for uh, an enormous range of um, projects describing and examining um, the Aboriginal So the first example is the May Kawaii study. I'm not actually sure I pronounced that correctly. I've only read, read information about the study, never heard, heard someone pronounce that, that word. I hope I've got that right. Um, it's a good example of how um, both prospective and retrospective linkage has been done to a baseline survey. So this is a pivotal study of, um, as a longitudinal study uh, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander wellbeing. Its particular focus is actually capturing large scale data on cultural practice and cultural expression and the impacts of those things on well-being. So it's a pivotally important study. 
And as I said, one of the really neat features of this is that the linkage is both retrospective and it's continuing perspective linkage to the baseline survey, survey data as well. So the administrative data that's linked here is health-related data. Um, so that includes hospital data, cancer registries, death data, and other disease markers as well. So doing this has a number of benefits, uh, but two of the primary ones are that you're linking to an independent source of objectively collected information. That's great. The baseline survey information is mostly self-reported information. Right? The linkage enables you to collect and compare with independently uh, sourced data that's objective. Uh, and it also enables you to um, have an, an ongoing uh, have ongoing information on those outcome indicators as well. So I believe the survey, the follow-up will be every three or four years, which is critically important and useful. And the linkages potentially enable uh, an ongoing source of um, information on some of these outcomes that can only be collected through the baseline survey uh, on, a, on a less consistent basis. So, and important to note that the linkages established through this project are uh, obtained with explicit consent uh, that are provided by the participants in the survey. And there's an opt-in process there, which I think is nice as well. Uh, the other example is the uh, what we call the watches. This, this uh, survey is close to my heart. Um, West Australian Aboriginal Child Health Survey. And this is, in some respects, pretty similar to the previous example that, uh, that I gave you. Um, uh, the main difference is being twofold. Firstly, the survey was conducted 20 years ago. It was enumerated 20 years ago. And the survey itself was cross-sectional, uh, not longitudinal. And the other important difference is that the new linkages, that is the prospective linkages, uh, will be obtained without explicit consent. The original linkages which provide retrospective information were collected at the time of the survey and were done with explicit consent, um, but the forward linkages have not been. Uh, and there's good reasons for that. It's a, a big logistical issue to um, chase up almost 6,000 uh, people who are the original people in the survey uh, 20 years after the survey was done. But it's important to note that I think the, um, the consent has been obtained now for these forward linkages, but it's been obtained to a very, very detailed community consultation process in order to obtain the ethical approvals for those forward linkages. That's important to note. Um, it, that was. That was community engagement work that took a couple of years to do, and then, and it really wasn't for the faint-hearted. So, uh, so that's that's been the enabler there for forward linkages. And I think this with the May Kawaii um, study, um, they both provide a really powerful picture of the connections between culture and well-being across the life course. So you've got really important, uh, well-constructed, well-captured information on culture at a baseline point in time, and the linkages enable you to really explore how they connect with well-being over the life course. Really, a really two good examples, a very powerful way to actually capture culture in a nice way uh, for, for a meaningful contribution in terms of examining uh, Aboriginal health. And that's that's it very quickly. And I'll just finish with some discussion points, uh, but invite, um, I guess, comments on any aspects of what I've spoken about. Uh, do you have any creative solutions in this space? Uh, have you applied this in any sort of cross country um, application? either harmonising data or enabling comparison with other Indigenous cultures. And critically, while well, I haven't touched on it, but I think it's worth sort of throwing in here, you know, should we be advocating for more relevant data to be captured in existing systems? I mean, I think I think that we should, and I think there's a scope and the possibility for doing it. Um, I'll leave it there, and Kalinda, I'll, I'll hand back to you. Great. Thanks, Carrington. Um, I Kathleen, did you want to take over to um, field some of the questions and um, facilitate that side of things? Because um, we've got quite a few questions here. Um, sure, yeah. I can start do that. that discussion. Yeah, great. I'll try and, I'll try and uh, go through them in order. Um, so one of the first... Um, around what other countries, um, do they use data linkage to enhance the quality or enumeration of uh, in Indigenous uh, people in their reporting? Does anyone else have any particular examples that they'd like to share with us? Jennifer Walker, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, it's Jen here. <laughs> I'm actually sitting in the dark. Um, my daughter, I'm, it's bedtime. It's bedtime for my daughter. I'm in Canada. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, you know, it's a bit different. Like I, I'm listening and trying to 
think about whether we do this and and the way we have been identifying indigenous people in the data sets is less um you know it's less we don't collect it each time a person has an encounter with the healthcare system so it's not like you might have people going in and out of indigenous identity status i guess so um, and we've been using sort of registry lists. So people who are registered First Nations or Métis citizens of a Métis nation is are some of those ways. But there are other ways So um, where people have been um, doing sort of primary data collection, sort of like um, Ray's work that you were talking about, um, where you do the primary data collection and then you link after. So then you allow people an opportunity to self-identify and then, and then uh, because I think the critical thing is starting with a population. Because if you, if you try and derive it from the um, health services data, then you're only accessing people, you're only identifying people who are accessing services. So this is one of the challenges we've had. So we have some Aboriginal specific um, health services, but then if we use that to sort of identify people, then we're only identifying those who access services and not those who maybe, you know, have gone several years without going to the hospital or the doctor or, you know, so I, I guess, um, yeah, so in Canada, we've, re we've mainly relied on registries for, for identifying um, individuals and less so on self-identification. And it doesn't, and people don't generally go in and out of their indigenous identity status in the data sets because it's sort of one list. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a really good point, um, Jen, because I think the that is a big difference to the Australian setting where we don't have a population register per se. We have lots of different administrative data sets that have varying degrees of population coverage issues or not. Um, and so often we're bringing together data from different settings and are trying to enumerate that way, which I think ties nicely when using identif um, Indigenous identification algorithms to enhance enumeration. Um, and just in, I would add to that that for people to be thinking about why people may choose to identify or not in different settings, uh, what the risks or benefits of identifying might be in different places for different population groups. Does anyone want to speak to that? Um, I'd just like to say that obviously it sounds like the a register like they have in Canada is probably the most similar to our all so somebody who is whenever they go and we know that under enumerates tremendously so i think whereas with us we have those in australia we have those difficulties of trying to make sense of all this changing identity the problem in canada is comp uh, probably a significant under counting and so uh, you have detailed knowledge of people who are consistently and very strongly identify and go out of the way to register, but actually you're going to miss a whole bunch of people. So your rates will, um, your, your rates might be overestimated because your denominator is smaller and, and you might get a particular type of person registering that might have better or worse um, outcomes. So it's obviously biased in a different way and we're just all living with different systems. Um, yeah, that's all. Fair. Yeah, I, I think it sort they, of depends well, what you think of as bias though, because like from the perspective of the Indigenous governance organizations that rely on those registries as their citizen base, then that's the population that's important to them. So that's the citizen population. Those are the member population that they are trying to make decisions on behalf of, that they have um, sort of a mandate to serve. So I think it depends. So, you know, I often hear that from the federal government, the provincial governments that, you know, we're where are the non-status First Nations people? Where are, and, and it is absolutely true that there needs to be systems for and uh, opportunities for people to self-identify. But um, from the perspectives of the Indigenous governance organizations, sometimes there's not a gap. Yeah, that's really good point, Jen. Um, James, would you like to speak? I think I can see your hand up there. 
Yes, thanks, Kathleen. I just wanted to uh, make a comment which goes to the earlier point I made during my presentation in session one about the lack of coherence in Australia. In fact, there are registers in Australia um, and they are governed by Indigenous led organisations known as Aboriginal land councils and native title service providers. The problem is that they're completely unintegrated with other data sets in Australia. So I was involved in a three year experimental linkage project with the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare when I worked as a forensic social anthropologist for one of these organizations in which we mapped our population model of the indigenous population of Southeast Australia, which exceeded 100,000 people into, uh, onto the enhanced national mortality data set held by AHW, we picked up 25% missing death records for Indigenous people. As an example, now we ran into big challenges because there is such a difference in culture between the way those Indigenous organisations model their own populations, which is by descent, so they can actually establish a gold standard benchmark for preemptively identifying Indigenous children, you know, before they're even born, as against what's going on in the health research and administrative sectors within Australia, which are completely different. And so, you know, this is a, a, a yawning chasm in, in this country at the moment, which I think could be addressed fairly quickly um, if we had the right people involved in, um, in the remedy. That, that's a great point, James. Uh, and it's all about, you know, which data sets are people even considering? As you say, they, these are out there and they're community governed and owned, but they're, they're not the typical data sets that, you know, governments are reporting on or that researchers have historically been using, at least in population health research. So that's an excellent point. And uh, speaks to the, you know, increasing um, cross-sectoral data linkages that are starting to happen, which is obviously really great. And hopefully we'll see more of this um, community governed data sources coming into play there. Uh, Kalinda, do you have anything to say on that topic at all? No. No, we've got five minutes left though, Kathleen. Um, okay. So yeah, we'll try and get through another two yep. questions. Okay. Yeah. So there were some questions um, around next around quite specific data sets that are, I mean, the, the terminology is making reference to some uh, Australian specific data. So when we say the PBS, I mean, the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, um, so where there's medicines dispensed and subsidised by the um, government or the Medicare benefits scheme, which is around claims data for um, seeing and specialists, et cetera, and questions around um, the accuracy of um, Indigenous, identifying Indigenous population from these types of data sets. I think it's worth just saying there's many different types of data sets. I would point many of you to the reference list we put together um, around documented enumeration issues and things like hospital data, ED, et cetera. Um, David's put his hand up to maybe quickly speak to very quickly the ED and hospitalisation validation work as one example. Would you would you like to comment on that, David? Uh, yeah, sure. And also just uh, to follow on from James's uh, sort of um, comment. I mean, it sounds like if there is a gold standard, you know, sort of data collection that allows uh, high quality identification of Indigenous people, and there was an appetite for uh, to have a discussion in terms of the the potential to use that to um, uh, actually facilitate a much higher quality level of evidence to be generated for average, Aboriginal people in terms of health and social outcomes. That might be worth ex exploring as Alison and, and Bridget identified. Um, getting the identification wrong in administrative data gives you wildly different results. And so you effectively you've got you know, useless information on which you're then trying to base policy and, and, and practice. So um, from that perspective, there might be an interest there uh, and it might be worth ex exploring, James, with your team and, and Marcia, uh, Marcia and, and others, because that would be a huge contribution uh, to, to allow quality evidence to be generated on priority questions that could also be generated from this group or, or Aboriginal um, people and communities. So just following on from that, um, so we have a cohort, uh, so where it's not just a, a sort of Aboriginal cohort, it's a, 
a, a larger cohort, but has a, a large number of Aboriginal people. Um, it actually, speaking to Carrington's point, interestingly, we haven't published the validation work, as I've said yet. We've, um, and it has people from Queensland and WA, around about 3,000 people, so it's not huge, but um, uh, but uh, effectively we have um, self-reported data from interviews um, uh, and we also got consent then to link in a whole range of health information but also social uh, sector information so we could explore this further. So we've got things like ED, mental health, uh, hospital inpatient, we've got child protection, we've got corrections, we've got drug and alcohol, um, uh, ambulance data. So we could actually do this sort of more broadly and I'd be happy to feed the re results back to those that are interested in. But prior to this session, I did just have a look to see what the um, level of ascertainment was uh, comparing self-report to ED and hospital admission. If you took the approach that um, Alison was talking about of either looking at inconsistent recording of Aboriginality or consistent recording. So not surprisingly, when you look at the non-Indigenous between self-report and ED and hospital for any uh, sort of either of those, it's pretty much 100%, um, so which is good to know. But when you look at Indigenous self-report versus inconsistent uh, identification in ED data, it's uh, around 97%, which is good. But if you include it for where it's more consistent, so it's 57%. So if you take the different approach, you're dropping out around about sort of, what, 40% of potential, uh, you know, sort of your population that are Indigenous, but would be identified as not Indigenous in ED data. And in hospital data, it's not as poor as that, but it's 94% for the inconsistent uh, versus 78%. So you're still underestimating or ascertaining Aboriginality in ED or hospital data by, you know, sort of anywhere from 20 to 40% if you're just using in, uh, administrative data, which is a huge problem because effectively you are going to get estimates that, um, uh, you know, sort of are not representative uh, and uh, sort of potentially not really sort of showing the true story. So anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd mention that. It is a major issue and there's some numbers from a cohort study that we have that demonstrate the, the level of um, uh, misclassification. So, um, so James, I think your group would, <laughs> could use those numbers and others. We could also provide numbers from other data sets as well to maybe, you know, broach mm -hmm. the just, you know, sort of topic for a discussion. But anyway, sorry, taking too long. Yes. Just on the um, on the collections coming from land councils as well, I mean, it raises the query around um, connection to community and country, and this provides you know an opportunity one to um, kind of I guess see those people who have got that connection, but we're also speaking within a colonial context, and these are kind of really I guess intensive conversations, and and we can't give them justice during this session at all. But it is worth, um, I think, acknowledging that um, those people who are highly affected by colonisation within Australia will not be included in those data sets. And so we need to unpick some of these issues when it comes to making sure that the counts of um, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander people and Indigenous peoples um, are are accurate. Um, and it also raises the question as to what do we want to measure? Um, and so, yeah, again, it comes down to the work that Carrington's doing as well around what matters and what values are pulled into this. And then, you know, how do we then, you know, build this story um, with data and information? It also raises the question as well as to should we be doing that with data? And so I just want to kind of leave the session there. I know it's kind of open-ended, um, but we've got to wrap up now. Um, but always happy to keep the conversation going into the future as well. Um, I want to thank our speakers. Um, I'm sure that they'll be happy for you to get in contact with them as well. Um, and, and, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave that there. Thanks. Hand back to you, Sandy. 
Thanks, Kalinda. That was a great session. Um, three great sessions, so much ground we've covered with input from Australia and from our friends in international settings. Um, my final task is to give the enormous job of summing up to Professor Marcia Langton from the University of Melbourne and the Indigenous Data Network. Thank you, Marci Marcia. Uh, thanks, Sandy. And, and thanks so much to everyone who's contributed uh, and to all attending. Uh, this has been uh, absolutely fascinating for me and I'm sure for all of you as well. Uh, I probably cannot do justice to uh, the sophistication and detail of, of the presentations, uh, but I'll try to uh, just work my way through uh, the points that were raised from the excellent notes sent to me by Rachel McEwen and Bridget McNamara. Uh, thank you for your assistance, Rachel and Bridget. So from the beginning, we uh, established that uh, self-determination for Indigenous peoples is a fundamental principle in our work in Indigenous data governance. Um, and that Indigenous data is a discrete subset of, of data um, uh, uh, a matter ably addressed by James Rose in his explanation of the colonial uh, context of uh, data mining uh, for the benefit of the colonial state um, in contradistinction to the fate of Indigenous peoples. So data... Uh, has been discussed here as an asset in which individuals hold an interest as owners. Um, we've talked about working with uh, data custodians such as the Australian Bureau of Statistics and the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, who've moved towards understanding Indigenous data governance um, in the terms that we've been discussing it here today. Self-identification and identification issues have loomed large throughout today's debate, especially in delivering hospital care. We've been treated to some excellent um, information and examples of data mapping and visualisation, uh, especially by Darren Clinch. Thank you, Darren. And further questions arise as a result of, of, of this work as to how uh, we can incorporate uh, cultural characteristics um, through data mapping and visualisation um, and by linking Indigenous data assets. Uh, and I think Darren has some answers to that question, but that's for another time. Um, linked data is important for a holistic view, leading to results evident in NAPLAN data. Um, I think we all understand that undertaking research um, only if it doesn't conflict with individual, individual rights and dignity um, uh, is a critically important aspect of the ethics that we hold, along with uh, community approval. Um, and there's a great challenge in harmonising the national discussion on these issues. So that's a, uh, a summary of session one. In session two, uh, these points were elaborated well and specifically mentioned uh, was the need for genuine and respectful partnerships with communities who, in, who are involved from the start, especially in the design. And now as we've explored the matter further, especially in the third session, we understand that, you know, <sighs> what we should measure and whether it's important to measure um, some trends must uh, be influenced to a very large extent by what communities want and by what individuals and families want to know what they want to know about uh, their situation. 
Um, mixed methods research allows for a better understanding of research problems through exploration of participant views and experience with the intent to examine these further with a larger population sample. Um, thank you, Jocelyn, for your excellent paper. I was so impressed with your methodology. Um, want to know more about your work. And also uh, in session two, we undertook group work to think about how to design a mixed method study um, of um, the needs of women in prison, uh, pregnant women in prison. This turned out to be a complex activity and, and difficult for those with either a more quantitative or qualitative approach. But I do think that we are uh, uh, we're well on the way to developing an extraordinarily good approach. Um, and what I want to know is when are we going to start the project? Uh, uh, in session three, um, very important um, results were presented on um, how identification processes affect the accuracy of data. Uh, this is just a mind boggling mess, isn't it? And it's one that we really need to fix in Australia. And perhaps we all need to think about having a session to find practical answers to uh, resolving these problems. This came up at our Indigenous data uh, oh, sorry, Indigenous um, Data Sovereignty Symposium, uh, when the ABS asked us, uh, should, the, should Indigenous people be able to identify in the census by their um, language or <coughs> by, their, by, their, by their language, for instance, um, <clears throat> most people avoided the issue and I don't think it's ever been resolved but the, as we know now, the issues are so much more difficult. Um, but I think uh, we ought to go back to that issue and, and um, uh, come up with some practical answers for the state and territory jurisdictions that fail to consistently identify uh, Indigenous children in particular. So in self-identification in Australia is an individual choice. But as we've seen, um, propensity may change over time and differ depending on the settings. And the settings are institutional settings where decisions are made by government personnel rather than individuals themselves. Algorithms can inflate or mask results and qualitative data can be used to test the consistency and accuracy of qualitative data. And some very important um, results were uh, reported on that, some very disturbing results. Um, administrative linked data typically includes limited information on culture, values and historical determinants of health. And I think we all uh, realise that we have the, uh, the capability to be much more creative in um, enriching um, data outcomes by including culture values and historical determinants of health. How we do that uh, is another question and one that I do feel that we have the capability uh, of, uh, um, of resolving to a very large extent and I look forward to further work on, on those issues. Mainstream indicators may not be applicable to Indigenous contexts. Um, and in session three, examples were shown of the connection between Aboriginal culture and health and well-being. Um, all of these questions uh, and matters were elaborated in the question time. Um, and I, I, I'm absolutely delighted to be a part of this extraordinary group. And I do hope, as Sandra uh, requested at the beginning, that we continue as, a, as an international working group and address these most important issues. Uh, please feel free to add to anything that I may have missed in this summary. Thank you. Over to you, Sandy. Thanks, Marcia. Great to be here with you and everybody else online. And um, it's been a pretty unique day, I think, with perspectives that, you know, have really challenged us and caused us to think 
think more broadly um, rather than um, each of us being in our sort of siloed approach to, to this area. I, I really would like to, just while we've got time, bring up the question of um, how we how we progress as a special interest group or a, a, a linked up group with an interest in Indigenous data through the through the um, the the international um, data linkage um, group. David Preen, do you have any suggestions about how we can practically progress that? I know you're involved in um, running the main meeting. Uh, yes, Sandra. So uh, apologies, I was just busily uh, sort of uh, frantically typing to, to somebody um, with a comment they had uh, in, in, in the chat. Um, so yes, yeah, so this was uh, sort of just an idea, as uh, Sandra has mentioned, in terms of um, uh, sort of the, is there an interest, and it appears there is, uh, sort of in maybe sort of extending beyond just this workshop. So this workshop's been excellent and it's raised a lot of ideas, but obviously we have finite time um, and we're sort of a, a small group more representative of a, a larger community out there that's sort of uh, grappling with the same issues that uh, have been raised uh, and explored today. So. Um, uh, sort of it was just um, a suggestion in terms of uh, would it be worthwhile sort of uh, beyond uh, sort of the, the workshop um, looking to formalize or establish some sort of consortium or network or group special interest group that's international so uh, and we invite people uh, to be involved where we can get together sort of uh, as a forum to discuss these issues more regularly also share information and learning so that it wouldn't be a case if we just have to get together every you know, six months or 12 months or whatever it be, but there's a sort of ongoing in real time sharing of data and clearing house for uh, sort of information um, uh, that can be disseminated in terms of how things are, are dealt with um, uh, sort of by those working in the area. And potentially we could approach the International Population Data Linkage Network to provide executive support for that um, so that they could provide that support going forward um, or another body if there's already a, a sort of others. I know Kalinda has mentioned there are some groups internationally already working in this space, uh, but more so at a national level rather than international level. So would it be worth bringing those people uh, together for a discussion. Um, uh, and then the idea really would be that it would need somebody, I guess, uh, sort of to put their hand up to drive it uh, and some people to champion, you know, particular areas. Uh, but it really be a case that in terms of operationalizing, if this looks like it's of interest and it has merit, um, subsequent to this uh, workshop, there could be, um, uh, sort of a sort of a follow-up briefing paper um, or very brief sort of one to two pager sort of uh, outlining the process uh, and sort of actually sort of then convening that first meeting uh, sort of, of of people that want to get together to explore the, the the opportunity to put something together so really that's as far as the discussions uh, and thinking had gone it was a case of so the question is, is, is this something that people think would be worthwhile pursuing so that um, effectively this workshop really is just the launching pad for a more sustainable ongoing conversation, bringing in international and national experts, uh, led by those that uh, are wanting to nominate to be champions in the area um, uh, and uh, indigenous people in particular that are sort of working in the area. Um, uh, and then also to try to tap into existing international networks to use their infrastructure, their support uh, to actually assist uh, sort of uh, the network or consortium going forward. So it's not too much work or too onerous for whoever it is that are, are going to drive that the, the sort of idea going forward. So I think I've probably said enough. That was was that what you were after, Sandra? Thanks, David. That was terrific. So uh, I, um, I was at the this international meeting in Banff in Canada, and it had a very Canadian view on Indigenous data sovereignty and um, use of data linkage. And 
Um, this is the second meeting I've been involved in. Actually, I've probably been involved in earlier ones too, but um, there are some advantages of COVID because there was a handful of Indigenous people involved at Banff, but it's terrific to have um, the very, very large number of participants on this workshop and there'll be other um, sessions in the main conference. Can I, um, I, I do think that there is potential to, um, to through this, this international data linkage network to, um, to progress a, a special interest group. Could, could I just see what everybody thinks online? Just use the show of hands function. If, if you're voting yes to um, not doing it, not volunteering yourself, but voting yes to the notion that if there was a, a special interest group, you'd be interested in joining that. A thumbs up or a, um, the, the, the show of hands or thumbs up icons. Um, so we've got, keep them up. We're, I think I think they go off actually as uh, after a short amount of time. So maybe just a visual. But I, th I think what I'm getting from people's photo, from images, video images and the thumbs up or the hands up is that there's a lot of interest around the room. So I'm assuming you found the content of today's workshop really stimulating, engaging, and you've learned from other people's approaches and it's worth continuing to do that into the future. Um, is there anybody who wants to volunteer to be part of a small working group of two or three people who um, try to lead this forward? If you could do a thumbs up or a hands up, just... I'm happy to volunteer myself, but also don't want to overpromise. Jocelyn Jones and Carrington Shepherd. I don't know if you've seen my thumbs up, Sandy. Oh, Kalinda oh Griffiths, Jocelyn Jones and Carrington Shepherd. Okay, so that's terrific. Um, so we've got that small working group, Kalinda Griffiths, Jocelyn Jones and Carrington Shepherd to progress the interest group. David, can I come back to you just to ask how, how we would do this now that you know our contact points and the expression of yes, there's there's general interest in progressing? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think what would be good is probably a first, uh, first up a meeting and I'm happy to be involved uh, to assist uh, um, Jocelyn, Kalinda uh, and Carrington. So to get together to talk through you know, potentially sort of next steps uh, and then approach, I think it would be worth approaching the IPDLM executive um, uh, to sort of say, look, this was raised at this workshop. It was overwhelmingly supported. Uh, coincidentally, uh, or, you know, sort of fortuitously, um, the IPDLM executive is changing hands as of January next year. So they will be looking also the directorship of that. So um, they'll be looking for new initiatives to drive. And so effectively, we should pitch it as here's one potentially ready made and we're happy to work with you. And I'd um, be very surprised if they don't embrace that. Um, and then I think what would be worthwhile is to then sort of discuss with them, you know, sort of what could be done. And then uh, from the uh, workshop uh, coordinators send out um, maybe a, just a one page communique to everybody that was is sort of uh, registered in this uh, sort of workshop to provide an update of where uh, things are going um, and then look to potentially convene a subsequent meeting and perhaps as part of that process um, uh, is to then identify maybe through the IPDLN and this broader workshop group and the smaller executive, who might be the key people in different regions of the world to reach out to, to say, look, this is launching. Uh, we'd like you uh, to be involved uh, and sort of, uh, and if not, is there somebody else they could suggest? So we bring people to the table from different countries because I am mindful that at the moment, 
because obviously with the time zones and also the fact this uh, this group was primarily um, Australian based that we are very Australian centric uh, sort of in the workshop. So, but I think it would be good for us to reach out um, uh, to those uh, sort of the leaders in the area uh, in other countries sort of to bring them to the table. So that would be my thoughts, but uh, maybe the small the sort of working group can flesh that out with through a, a Zoom meeting. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, once the IPDLN have said yay or nay, um, we can send through a very brief summary communique to everyone else uh, and maybe even ask people at the time if they have contacts uh, in different parts of the world to please send them through. And then we can get the ball, ball rolling from, from there. But <coughs> I haven't really thought this through. It was just an idea. So that's uh, just thinking out loud that I think would be the best way forward, but happy to take other suggestions. Uh, thanks, David. So I feel as if we have a way forward, enormous interest, um, a startup working group, some thoughts about how to engage and make it a truly international working group and an offer from the Indigenous Data Network to also engage with that small working party. Um, so thank you. I think that's a great out. It's been a great discussion over the course of this morning or this evening, wherever you are. Um, the final, the final thing we'll do, I, you may, people may leave at their leisure, um, but Bridget, is it right? We'll, we'll leave the video um, images. I'd like to thank. I, I don't want to go through and thank all of the, the, the presenters and contributors today, but I just do want to thank Bridget McNamara for the overall background organisation of today's workshop and Rachel McEwen for her fabulous project management administrative support for all of us. I think it's really contributed to the, to the, to the workshop running very smoothly. And I'd also like to thank our graphic recorder, Zara Zanal. Um, it's been terrific to see the images, the representation um, of, of the proceedings as we've gone on. And um, so you can leave the workshop at your leisure. Um, but we will leave the images in place until, um, and I think um, uh, different images in place until 2 p.m. The, the, the end time for our workshop in seven minutes. So thank you all once again. Um, and I'd like to officially close the workshop.